Today's episode is sponsored by Mud Water. Mud Water is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With one seventh the caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get energy without the anxiety, jitters, or crash of coffee. Each ingredient was added for a purpose cacao and chai for mood and a microdose of caffeine, lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to help support physical performance, chaga and rishi to support your immune system, turmeric for soreness, and cinnamon for antioxidants. If you're a long-time listener to the show, you may have heard me say I'm having a cup of mud during an episode before. My current favorite is the new Rest Blend, a non-caffeinated tea, which has become part of my evening routine. And not only am I an avid customer, but I love the product so much I became an investor in the company. If you haven't listened already, check out episode 259 when I spoke to Mudwater founder and CEO Shane Heath about why he started the company. Mud is Whole30 approved, 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Go to mudwater.com slash meb to support the show and use code FABER, that's F-A-B-E-R, for 15% off. That's mudwater.com slash meb and use code FABER for 15% off. Chris, welcome to the show. Meb, wonderful to be here. I've been a fan of your pod since I started listening to podcasts a handful of years ago. This is a real treat to get a chance to talk to you here. We got to cut to the chase and get to the heart of the matter. What is a Denver native doing in St. Louis? Uh, I was kind of in the right place, right time, wrong place, wrong time. Out of school, I did a thing in the commercial paper world, which would occupy too much time for the pod. But my first real job was... You mean commercial paper like Dunder Mifflin? You were doing like sales of commercial paper or you're actually in like finance commercial paper? Yeah, I invented this commercial paper synthetic pass-through security when Chrysler lost their debt rating as part of an entrepreneurship class and wound up getting Jerry York at Chrysler on board when they were losing their debt rating. The money markets had just been limited to owning no more than 5% of their, their holdings as anything other than top rated A1, P1 paper. And so Chrysler Finance was out of the market. And by trying to get other issuers to come in and create a pool, have Chrysler pay for the lines of credit, letters of credit, lower their cost of capital relative to the bank world and the top rated A1, P1 issuers that would come in would not be paying for the insurance backing on the pool. So tried to make that work, ran back and forth from New York a bunch and met a bunch of people and went to work for a bank trust company in Kansas City, Missouri, who had a Denver operation and a St. Louis operation. So as a young guy, after a few years at the, at the HQ, I went to St. Louis to become the first portfolio manager analyst outside of the Kansas City headquarters operation and really with an eye toward winding up back in Denver and wound up meeting, uh, being introduced to a family that became my anchor client. I spent a chapter in my letter this year talking about the story. Jim Grant talked to me in December and had a nice piece in, in his newsletter, um, talked about this gentleman's being born in 1903, getting out of the stock market in 1928. Yes. I, w- I want to talk about him, but I have to interrupt you because it's more important to me so do you remain a Denver Broncos fan? Cause like, that's really, cause you, you still have an office in Denver, right? Or is that your partner? Yeah. My partner's there. I've still got a lot of family there. A lot of friends in Colorado. I spend time there. Okay. So I, yeah, I was, I was a Bronco fan, grew up with them. Um, okay. Good. The, now, now we've gotten past that. Okay. Now, as long as you're just not like, you know, Meb, I'm, I'm a huge uh, Chiefs fan, or well, I'm well. I like the Chiefs as well. I mean, I, I'm, well, okay. I'm not. I'm not wholly committed to a single sounds like guys. sounds like a hedge fund manager hedging his bets right there. Okay, so but, but um, far from fair weather. So you uh, you write some great letters, and listeners, um, Chris has got all these letters on his website, so you got to go check them out. I'm going to warn you. Uh, you're going to commit the weekend to this because some of these suckers are 100 pages plus. Uh, they're well worth it. They go back all the way to 99. Um, but I was laughing as you were talking about, I want to hear this story. And I believe the the fella you're going to talk about is named Robert Smith, which is not the private equity Robert Smith, who got into a little bit of trouble uh, uh, for a few years about washing his his uh, money in the Caymans or something, right? Um, tell me about your Robert Smith. Well, this was by far uh, about the polar opposite of that Robert Smith. Yeah. So I was I was running money for the bank trust company and introduced to a gentleman who's one of his relatives that heard me speak. And uh, he was concerned about the stock market 
and debt levels. And this this was 1998, kind of late 98. And and um, and to I want to lay a little more groundwork, and I'll stop interrupting you. But like when you say managing money, like was your approach similar then? And and like old old Uncle Buffett, like were you inoculated in a certain style? Because mid 90s, everyone I knew was was trading the dot coms, baby. Yeah, I never got into it. We, we being the bank trust company, the old United Missouri Bank, we were, it, it was very much a value approach, but it was price to earnings, price to sales, price to cash flow, dividend yield. Nobody was looking for a moat. And being a conservative, too conservative place, as banks typically are, you know, we had several hundred stocks in a portfolio. So it was a little bit of a pseudo index fund. The family that ran the bank had dictated durably high levels of cash reserves because, you know, the history of being scarred by the depression and by the inflation in the 70s and by the 1987 stock market crash, which was still a fresh memory when I started working for the shop in 1991, um, just persisted throughout the whole bull market with big levels of cash reserves. And you know, I, I, I came to Ben Graham only after kind of learning about Berkshire Hathaway for the first time when they issued the, the B shares in 1966. My business partner, Chad Christensen, who was a good friend, we went to school together, had always kind of theorized we'd run a money management company together. Hmm. He and my former father-in-law now passed away, great guy, uh, lived in Omaha and said, you ought to look into this Berkshire Hathaway thing, which I did. And we didn't cover it at the bank. I mean, we had a research library that was as big as a football field with annual reports going back decades on lots and lots of companies. And so I looked into it and I, I pitched it and wrote it up. And the pushback from my boss, who was a great diet in the wool value investor, was that nah, it's really just a mutual fund and drag, um, which it clearly was not. It was very much an insurance operation at the time. In any event. Did you not just respond, we're a mutual fund and drag, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we were a mutual fund and drag. Right. <laughs> And I was, I was running one of the mutual funds in drag that was yeah. a balanced fund. And so it really wasn't yeah. drag, um, very much cross-dressing. In any event, um, so wound up in St. Louis and introduced to this gentleman who, uh, you know, his story was just phenomenal. Um, by that point, he was in his mid-90s. This was 1998, so 94, 95 years old. But he, he was initiated into the stock market at an early age. He'd gone to Princeton, played football road, um, did boarding school in the East, uh, prep school, and post-school, his father had passed away, and he came into the family's brokerage firm, which still exists by name in St. Louis in the mid-1920s, call it 1925. And by 1928, he was concerned about the bubble that was brewing in the stock market and in the economy. And he pulled the plug on stocks and he took all of his family's money. And it was an old St. Louis family, Robert Brookings Smith. So the Brookings and the Brookings Institution, he was Robert S. Brookings' nephew. So the family had some capital. And so he got out and any clients that would listen to a kind of wet behind the ear kid followed him out the door. Well, if you know your stock market history, early 1928 was a year and a half uh, before the peak. So if you go back and look at a chart of the Dow, it would have been at about 200 and didn't peak until 384 or 387 in the fall of 29. So that would have been like getting out of the stock market in 1996 or 97 and watching the tech bubble rage and the NASDAQ run from 1,000 to 5,000. The pressure on a kid would have been immeasurably high, but obviously then fully vindicated by the 89% decline in the Dow and the stock market and the depression that ensued. And he didn't dollar cost average in. He waited until literally the bottom when he could buy things like GE for less than the cash in the business. And then we were in the midst of depression that had taken unemployment from 4% to almost 25%. Businesses were not making money. So we had an enormously um, underutilization of the capital stock. GE was not making money, but you could buy the business for less than the cash. And that would have been kind of Ben Graham's iteration of the net net working capital. And so back into the market, he went and over the years picked up things like Merck and later Walmart, later in the game, Sun Microsystems. He was a very good investor who uh, 
really after that initial decision never touched a position um unless something you know was you know it's, wrong. It's, it's funny because if you look back to that time and um there's a handful of examples that are so instructive uh listeners there's a great book we'll put it in the show note links called the great depression a diary where there's a guy that's kind of talking about what's happening during that period but um a similar story also with with templeton buying stocks at that period where you know just people forget but like during a crisis and you know down 80 is a lot different than down 50 um which of course is a lot different than down eight percent or whatever we're at now and you know, even having assets at that period is like full candy store, right? Like, like, cause no one does, you know, and you talk to various investors around the world over the last 10 years where they've been decimated in Greece and, and other places. And it's a similar reaction. They're like, look, I, I know um, Greece may be a bad example, but, but places where the markets have gone down 80, 90%, a lot of people say, Hey, look, I, I imagine there's lots of opportunity, but no one has any money, right? Like we, we've already lost it all. So to even have some, some ability to buy at that point seems uh, so advantageous, but also so rare. That's a, that's a great book. The, it just anecdotally in it, you, had, you have stories about the, the doctors, you know, the family practitioners, the accountants who maintained their practices. They were independent business people. And, but their clients had no money. Nobody had any money. They, they didn't get paid. And so, you know, even if you had investment capital, you weren't making any money. Unemployment was, again, sky high, but even those that were gainfully employed um, didn't have the resources. So they had to live through their capital. Very, very few had money on hand. And if you did, you were so scarred by the downturn that that was the beginning of creating an entire generation that never, ever trusted the stock market. They thought it was a game that was rigged against them. Ben Graham blew himself up. Um, Keynes blew himself up. And, you know, well, Keynes and Graham were writing when, when Ben Graham was writing security analysis, Bob Smith was buying companies with family capital. And he understood the notion that if you used eventually the idle capacity inside of GE, that eventually the company would make money. And it was just a brilliant investment. But if you fast forward all of those decades, and, I, and, and in the letter, I, I weave the story and I really want it to be well done. I'd never mentioned him in a public setting in my career, guard our clients' privacy. Uh, and when Jim wrote that up and I told the story, I did not mention him specifically. And in fact, Jim called me right before he went to press and said, hey, could I, would you mind if I could, could, would you let me know his name? And could I mention, it? I said, Jim, I can't do that. I've never done it. You know, the family's still very private and guarded. And, you know, he's such a good writer. It turned out to be such a good piece. In fact, he's asked me to speak at his fall conference this year, which will be a highlight. Um, but I went to. We, we did daughter. a, uh, we did a, we do this quote of the day which by the way, you're going to be featured in uh, eventually coming up because you are very quotable in your writings, by the way, Chris. But we did one from uh, Jim Grant the other day. And often our quote of the day, it's like, uh, listeners, if you don't follow me on Twitter, um, it's, a, uh, it's like those old school word of the day calendars. I used to love those uh, back in the day. But um, we did one with, uh, with um, Jim Grant that was, it might, might have been our most popular to date, um, to suppose that the value of a common stock is determined purely by a corporation's earnings discounted by the relevant interest rates and adjusted for the marginal tax rate is to forget that people have burned witches, gone to war on a whim, risen to the defense of Joseph Stalin, and believed Orson Welles when he told them over the radio that the Martians had landed. I <laughs> said so it was such a great quote. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but so you're speaking as conference. When, so uh, if listeners want to attend, uh, do we do we know uh, the dates? You said it's in the fall. Do you know where? Tuesday, October 18, I believe at the Plaza Hotel. New York City. All right, it's good time to be there in the fall time. All right, so sign up listeners. Uh, uh, keep going. So anyhow, yeah, um, kind of circling back, I guess. I was, so, I, so, I talk, so I called his daughter on what would have been his 119th birthday. You know, he didn't have kids until he got back from having volunteered to go fight in World War II as an old man, not a young man. Um, couldn't bear to not be in the fight. Talked to his friends in the War Department to letting him in the fight. Um, 
he captained some training ships on Lake Michigan. The Navy still has a big training uh, facility there. And at a point, he just felt a duty to his country to be in the fight and wound up eventually being second in command on a light carrier, the White Plains. I put a picture of the, the ship uh, in my letter. And you know, he had pictures in his office when I first met him and, of the Japanese Zeros that were dropping torpedoes and several of the, the uh, uh, ships in the fleet were sinking uh, plumes of water from the bombs hitting the water as high as the office tower that we were in. And as I got to know him over the years, he would confide a lot in me. And he said, you know, almost, almost nightly for his entire lifetime, and this is now a man in his late 90s, so I can't shake the nightmares from World War II. He was in the Battle of the Philippines. Um, it just a, a, a remarkable man. So anyhow, um, you know, having guarded his privacy and that of his family for years, I called his daughter on, on his 119th birthday and uh, told her what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to kind of link his investment history uh, and the decisions that he made over time, particularly at the secular, at, at important secular peaks and troughs, and kind of link it to what Warren Buffett had done uh, as well at very important seminal lows and highs in the market. And you know, for that, I wanted it to turn out to be a, a very, very well done piece. And she was thrilled. Um, I, I sent it to her and it took her two weeks to get back to me and perhaps because the letter's so long, but she said, um, and, and her husband had just passed away. And uh, she said she was pretty emotional over it and cried and brought, brought best, stirred, stirred up a lot of memories. And so I was thrilled at the outcome. I, I, I hope it turned out well. Um, but when I got to know him, you know, he, he made his next great pivot. So he made, he made the great pivot, obviously, in getting out of the market in 28, hard to do, uh, got back in at the absolute low in 1932, hard to do. And then he didn't really touch it. He didn't do anything in the late 1960s, um, unlike what Warren Buffett did in closing down eventually his partnerships. He originally stopped taking capital in 66, uh, closed them all together in 69 and wound up effectively just keeping Berkshire Hathaway. But he knew the stock market was expensive. It was not his game anymore. And you know he had bought the textile business and then bought the insurance operation, which gave him fodder and capital to go to war in the 1970s against the bear market that persisted for 17 years. Traded in a range bound uh, cycle and it went from very expensive in the late 60s to seven times a 3% margin in 82. And in any event, they both made an extraordinary pivot in 1998, when Mr. Smith hired me, um, and as Jim put it, we joined forces, which I thought was just the, the, the most perfect way to put it, because we really did. Um, where Warren Buffett had the high class problem of having had so much success as a stock picker, and in the operation where the stock portfolio had compounded at nearly 30% a year for 30 years, 35 years, 33 years. Um, he had Coca-Cola, which was a 13 bagger, in the five years that he'd owned it, it was 40% of the stock portfolio. The stock portfolio inside of Berkshire was 115% of book value. Corporate marginal tax rate was 35%. So, you know, he's never been a fan of paying taxes. And so by then buying general reinsurance using Berkshire shares as currency, when they traded at twice what you'd call intrinsic value, they were trading at 2.9 to book. He wound up picking up a giant bond portfolio, diversifying Berkshire's concentrated stock portfolio to where stocks dropped from 115% a book down to 69% a book. GE brought something like 45% of the assets to the combined entity, but only wound up with 18% of the ownership of the entity. It was just a brilliant masterstroke and, and, and it allowed then the surplus capital that, ex that existed inside Berkshire to be upstreamed and very quickly by the first utility operation, MidAmerican Energy, eventually by the railroad in 2009. Well, Mr. Smith, on the other hand, had this high class problem as well, a very low basis portfolio that had grown by his favorite expression, benign neglect. <laughs> and it would have been your coffee can approach where you're just not paying taxes. You didn't have qualified 401ks and IRAs, and you know it's it's actually interesting there. We can talk about that as from a financial planning standpoint. But I'm seeing more and more people, myself included, with way too many qualified assets that now have to be distributed over a 10-year period. But that's a total total tangent. In any event, 
not a fan of paying taxes. So he GE was half of the family's portfolio with a basis that was less than the, the quarterly dividend, if you can imagine. Um, GE had, had problems by then under Jack Welch. They'd taken two thirds of the business uh, and bought up all the various reinsurance operations and finance businesses, consumer lending operations. The leverage embedded in GE was extraordinary. Um, they had a lot of off balance sheet liabilities. So I, I thought, and he thought GE was by this point a problem. So we set up a family foundation and some charitable remainder trust that would feed he and his wife income during their lifetimes, eventually with all of the assets winding up in the foundation. Uh, and over the course of spreading over a couple of years, the, the contributions to the foundation and to the Kratz was able to take big tax deductions for the charitable gift. These were assets that were headed to charity anyway. And I was able to liquidate the vast majority of that portfolio, 90% of the GE. You said, Chris, this, this, this one holding has been so good to the family. Well, I'll let you sell 90% of it, but I'm just going to keep 10. Well, that, that GE position was between, it's down 80 or 90%. But I sold it pre this reverse split that they just did, the one for seven split. Sold it between 50 and $60 a share. And with the proceeds, that's, yes. That, I was going to say that's a great behavioral psychological hack. You know, we tell a lot of people that struggle with this, always the decision they think has to be all in, all out. And, you know, we say it's less satisfying to many because they want to gamble on either outcome or cheer, cheer for the outcome. All right, I've sold it. Now I want it to go down or I, I'm still owning. I want it to go up. But, you know, it's funny how they said, okay, look, no, I, I want to at least retain a little bit for this you know, partially sentimental value or just because, you know, we, we want to have some of it, but it's a, it's a good way to help, help you behave a little bit. I think. I've learned the lesson over the years and I should have just learned it at that point because I've, I've made the, I've made the mistake many times. In fact, a theme of one of my letters a handful of years ago was the university of Ross. And my single biggest investment mistake ever was having sold Ross stores two and a half years after purchase when the tech bubble was raging. There was a lot of value under the under the surface, and, and and this really was the extension and the continuation of this great pivot that we made by selling GE and selling the commodity chemical companies, the baby bells, a lot of businesses that were no longer earning their cost of capital. If you objectively kind of drilled under the hood into the accounting properly, and with no capital gains taxes liquidated, but instead of doing what he did in 1928 and sitting in cash waiting for a bottom. The market was so bifurcated that this is where we really added a ton of value is, is the average business had been crushed as the tech bubble raged. You had all of these small mid-cap businesses, fire truck manufacturers, little banks and thrifts, uh, generic drug companies that were trading at seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times earnings at the moment that the S&P traded in the high 30s in the NASDAQ at 242 times. And so one of the positions that I bought was this great little retailer, Ross Stores. What, what year which, would this have been for, uh, for Timeline Ballpark? Oh, 99, um, 99 or early 2000. And this, okay. Ross was trading at 10 times earnings. It made no sense. They had about 350 stores. Uh, unit economics were phenomenal. They didn't have on balance sheet debt other than if capitalization of the operating leases, and the units were earning high teens returns on capital. But because it was in the small cap bucket, the value bucket, if you were a small cap value manager, you were getting redemptions on a daily basis. Walter Schloss was getting fired by his clients. People were apoplectic with Warren Buffett for not having tech in the portfolio. And you had all of these flows. You know, Your 401k investor got that quarterly statement and saw the NASDAQ and the tech funds and the Janus funds and the Invesco growth funds up you know, 70, 80% in 1999. And they all, the world was chasing tech. And to maintain sanity didn't mean you maintain clients because you, human nature being what it is, they wanted to chase it. And so you had all of this sell pressure on these real businesses for no operational fundamental reason other than they were in the wrong style bucket. And so I paid 10 times earnings for Ross for a business that was going to grow its store count rapidly and had a very long runway to grow. And as March 10 came and went, 
and everything that I owned, which leading up to March 10 was down every day. The NASDAQ was up every day. I'm sitting there trembling at my desk on March 10, actually penned a little note to Alan Abelson saying, this is just crazy. I mean, the market value of the NASDAQ almost- <laughs> were, were you, were you, did you have any pressure from uh, the, your, your, um, your bosses at that period? Were they getting kind of drawn into this as well? Because it, it was kind of really impossible to avoid. Well, yeah, the yeah. The, so when we started the firm in '98, several of the clients that I had developed at, at the bank trust company followed me out the door, and um, almost to a client, the pressure was huge. You know, I was I was 29 years old, almost 30 when we started the company, and the pressure to not own tech and to party with that rising bubble um, was immense. In fact, you know, Chad, my business partner, had done he, he'd spent years in public accounting. He was an auditor. And, you know, we're out holding clients' hands who had just come in and, you know, the, the, the pressure, the meetings that we had to take and the calls that we had to take, he said to me, is it going to be this hard? You know, are these meetings are going to be this difficult? And I said, no. I said, when this bubble passes and, you know, you get back to a more normal world. No, I said, the next time we're going to have this kind of pressure will be at whatever the next market low is when nobody wants to own a stock. And that would have been 1932 or that would have been 1982. Um, but it passed and, um, you know, literally on March 10, the, the, the screen flipped and everything I owned was straight up. Everything down was, uh, you know, the NASDAQ stuff rolled over and, and, it, and it was an evolving, it was an evolving bear market. It feels and looked a lot like what's transpired in the last six months. You know, the very high speculative companies, a lot of the things that some of your more speculative investors that had so much success in 2020 had had those are the places where these stocks are down 50, 60, 70, 80%, and they're still trading at six, seven times sales. The same thing happened in 2000. I mean, it took the full three years to cleanse valuations of the excesses. Well, you and, talked about this in one of your letters, <clears throat> it might've been your most recent or one of your pieces, I can't remember which, but, you know, was talking about, uh, and you can expand on this, but, you know, the separation of a business i feel like you were talking about microsoft but it could apply to cisco and many others and the stock where i hear all the time on twitter people are like meb this is nothing like 2000 because companies today have revenue and companies back then were only valued on eyeballs and i was like well you know that's funny because i go up and pull up the top 10 market cap stocks from 99 and I was like, most of them had 10 to hundreds of billions of revenue, right? These like, yes, there were the CMGIs of the world um, because that was me owning that. So I was, I was a little younger and, and more caught up in this. Um, uh, but there was also very real businesses and, and many of those businesses, and you can expand on this, not only survived, they thrived, but the stocks in many cases did nothing for a long time. Yeah, Sun Microsystems, which we owned and sold, um, Oracle, uh, Lucent, America Online, which engineered one of the greatest mergers of all time when they convinced Jerry Levin to sell uh, Time Warner to them. Um, and AOL brought 15 or 20% of the cash flows to the party, but th these, were, these were real businesses. I, one of my early letters, which is on the website, and I've, I know I've talked about it on at least one podcast, but I, I had a series, and Jim mentioned it in the write-up in, in his interest rate observer in December. I had penned a series of predictions uh, on March 1, 2000 for the millennium. Kind of fun, but went through a series of, I thought interest rates would eventually trade below 3%. They were north of six at the time. Market cap to GDP would revert back to some more normal level. But my first prediction was Microsoft shareholders as a proxy for this tech sector, the real businesses with large revenues, in, in a lot of cases, very large profitability, were simply inflated to bubble levels on a price basis. Microsoft was doing at that time $20 billion in revenues. It was not a small company. They had compounded their sales at something like 45% a year since their 1986 IPO they were doing a 38% profit margin. So call it $7.5 billion in net income 
on 20 billion in revenues. This was an immensely successful, fast growing, profitable business that had no fundamental flaws other than the fact that they had massively diluted the shareholders on the way up. The world hasn't, the Silicon Valley really hadn't caught on to sherry purchases, but they really had figured out share grants and options were out of control. Um, companies giving away four, five, six, seven percent per year to their executives and key employees. It was insane. Microsoft had diluted the shareholders by 40 percent since the IPO and had no need for capital. There was no reinvest. It was, it was the first real great capital light business, but it traded at a $620 billion cap on 20 billion in revenues. It was 31 times revenues. And so I pinned that I thought shareholders would lose money for 15 years, which they did. And six, seven years into that 15 year period, I was buying the stock at 15, 12, and then for less than 10 times free cash earnings. The stock had gotten crushed, it declined by three quarters, call it two thirds at least, I mean, it dropped from 60 to 20. So you were down by two thirds. They had only paid a few modest dividends. They paid a $3 or $3 and 20% or 20 cent special dividend early on, but the stock had just been hammered. But in the meantime, the business was still growing and they, they were a monopolist. In fact, I don't think people don't, wouldn't remember this, but back in the early nineties, Apple was failing. They were going bankrupt and Microsoft already had antitrust pressures from the justice department and from the European regulators. They needed a competitor. They made an investment in Apple to keep Apple alive. Steve Jobs was was done. He was cooked. The business was so, gone. It was so unpopular. I remember like the announcement and getting boo booed when uh, Microsoft came on the, uh, the the video feed. It was just an extraordinary time. And so um, I can't let you get away with hearing the ending of your Ross stories, by the way. Oh, right. Because yeah. I, I pulled up a chart. So tell me the punchline here, because this is... Um, this is already making my palms sweat. This chart is one of the most, I had to resize the chart because it's like, a, uh, it's it, it, like you need a log chart for this because it's a, it's a beauty. So you've held this for 20 years? Is that the- Oh, I wish I had. Um, <laughs> no, the, the disaster of disasters was about two and a half years in. We had made about two and a half times our money and the stock would have been trading for a mid twenties, low twenties, let's say multiple. And the S&P had dropped by 50%. We had made about 30% returns on the portfolio. Everything just worked. You know, all these things that were so cheap were Berkshire Hathaway, which had fallen 50% from the point at which they bought January. We bought in February of 2000. It was immediately up by the end of March of that year. Um, so I sold all of the Ross and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm, I still at that point hadn't kind of figured out moats and returns on capital the way I should have. And I thought, well, I'll just, to your point, we'll circle back and get this thing again, but it's gone from 10 times earnings to what appeared to be very expensive. So I sold the whole damn thing. And Ross wound up being one of the top performing stocks post 2004 when I sold it. I mean, just the most regrettable decision in my life. It's, it's been more than a 20 bagger since we sold it. And that, that's, that's not counting the two and a half X gain that we had on the front end of it. And so, yeah, I'm looking at the chart and like split adjusted or whatever the, the chart being, it's like a dollar or two in 2000. It's a 108 today. So listeners, you can do the math, yeah. but and I did, did that multiple times. I did that. But multiple uh, times. were you not in any way uh, interested? It had a pretty fat drawdown in the pandemic. We did that ever like, or, or are you totally done with it? You're like, you know what? I'm, I can never go back to this, this, uh, this name, I have too much, uh, too much emotions in this, or did, or did it uh, kind of siren, siren song you back in 2020? Uh, I thought about it, um, really did. I, I had picked up Costco shortly after having sold Ross and having made a number of decisions of things like that, that I just sold completely out of the portfolio. The lesson I learned that I wish I'd learned or known right at the outset through the lens of, gee, all, all the GE in retrospect, would have been better to sell the whole thing because the stock's 80% below where it was. I mean, you take a million dollars in capital down to $200,000 versus the 12, 13, 14 X that we've made on our stock portfolio since then. And the Delta there is pretty extraordinary. So that probably would not have been the, 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 the lesson in terms of keeping things, but Ross scarred me badly. 
and you know a number of those things that I'd done. You know, Costco, you look at the total return on Costco. I paid twenty nine bucks a share for Costco in twenty nine or in two thousand and four, I believe two thousand and four. In the interim, and Costco oddly had about the same number of stores that Ross did, but Ross had a runway to open a lot more stores per year. Costco has never deviated from the cadence of opening about 20 to 25 stores per year. So now they're pushing 850 stores. They're opening their fourth store in St. Louis here. Um, but between here and there, they've paid four special dividends. In fact, when I first bought it, they paid their first regular dividend. And they announced a payout that was about 20% of their annual profit. And I thought, oh, this is not good because here's a business that absorbed every dollar of retained earnings and opened new stores with it. Is the fact that they're now paying a dividend reflective of the fact that they don't have the same opportunity to keep opening stores? And turns out their model allows them and their real estate team to do 20 to 25 stores per year. So as cash would build up, it gets even better balance sheet than Ross. I mean, they, they in, use very few operating leases. So, you know, cash always exceeds the little bit of debt on the balance sheet. They own 80% of their land and their stores. So, you know, it's just all cash on cash investment. But between here and there, we've earned a $29 in special dividends. They paid $7, then 10, then seven. Uh, and then another one, um, I guess 10 most, I, mean, I, I guess they paid five, seven, five, seven, 10. And then, so 29, so at, which ironically absolutely matches my cost basis, my original cost basis in the shares. And I paid 20 times earnings for it, but it wasn't really earning 20 times because on an eight year maturity schedule until their brand new stores get enough members and enough throughput in the stores, the, the, the new stores under earn on what a mature store would look like on a return on capital basis. And so there was a masking of profitability there. But we've probably picked up, I'm gonna guess 17 to 20 bucks in regular dividends, but the stock is almost $600 today. It's been another one of those. And, and over the years, I've thought it was expensive. It is expensive. I mean, it's very, very expensive today. It's trading north of 45 times what they're gonna earn this year. And so I've sold it back out of all, almost all of our non-taxable accounts, but where I've got very low basis, I've kept it. And so what I've resolved on in the last oh, more than a decade is we do a lot of different things with capital. I mean, I've got businesses that I really wanna own forever for 30 years. I've got big investments in energy and some cyclicals. And those are things where I, I intend to liquidate the entire position at a point. You're buying them for a price, you're selling them for a price. There's a thesis, there's a theme to driving profitability higher, but you're playing with the capital cycle. In the case of businesses you durably want to own, I've learned that by keeping a small position in the portfolio, I've made a bunch of money with Nike. And I took Nike back a year and a half, two years ago uh, to a half percent position. And a half percent position is not going to kill me. You know, if it declines, whatever, but it forces me to, to see it in my portfolios every day. And from an opportunity cost standpoint, every day you're assessing the relative valuations of everything you've got in the portfolio. And what I've got cash and cash flows, cash from dividends, cash from deposits, cash from new clients, cash from, from, from transactions, proceeds of sales, either trims or outright sales in the portfolio. I've always got cash. And I'm always assessing against an opportunity cost. Uh, my, I've learned, you know, another lesson is the ability to pay a higher price, a much higher price, um, even in the short term than you've paid recently. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm buying things that double the price today, at which I paid a little more than a year ago on some new positions. And so I think I also, I heard later in life that, that um, um, Lou Simpson had adopted kind of that same approach where he always kept at least some portion of a position size in a portfolio. So I think for those things that you really have done all that work on and you know them like the back of your hand, when the valuation is so high, it compels you to trim it. And we do that, I think, really well. I think that's one of the things that we do extremely well is, is manage around the intrinsic value appraisals of the companies in the portfolio and always trying to keep the whole portfolio valuation cheap. But oh. Starbucks, Nike, Costco are, are, are durably long-term ownership positions that I will come back into in scale 
at when, when prices make more sense. Well, I think that methodology is thoughtful and, and listeners um, take a look at your portfolio because what Chris partially is talking about too, is like you, you establish a position and we polled our Twitter followers and it's like 95% or something when they buy a position have no general sell criteria you know, everyone spends so much time on the buy. Like I got to find the perfect investment. Is this the right time? They buy it and they kind of sit back and say, okay, let's see what happens. And as we all know, that's sort of a recipe for disaster because what are you going to do if it goes down 50 or 75%? What are you going to do if nothing changes, but the valuation doubles? What are you going to do if the CEO gets into a car wreck? All these things. But the one you're talking about, I think is really thoughtful. You're like, look, I'm probably going to fall in love with this business. We love the stock, but at some point, you know, it, it's probably worth trimming or selling some. And so having this sort of tolerance bands about, and we talk about this in markets, like big stock market terms, but also with names is there's a price where it's just good risk management and position sizing to trim the security. Yeah. The, yeah. I think, um, you know, if, if your process centers around the intrinsic value of what you own, on any given day, everything you own is going to trade at some discount or premium to that assessed value. And if you spend the majority of your time thinking about what can go wrong and whether you've got high levels of competition coming where you don't have the moat that you thought or the valuation has changed yeah, I, I think if you can get your mind around opportunity cost, um, it's valuable. And then risk management. I mean, Lordy, I mean, I had, I've had some energy businesses that um, went into kind of that post-2015 peak in oil north of $100. We had this wild cycle of just massive CapEx on exploration, new equipment, service equipment, and the energy patch absolutely overspent on trying to replace reserves. And they were spending so much money that there was no way to get an, econ an economic return on the capital that was spent. And so, you know, I own a business in Norway that does 3D seismic uh, imaging. So they've got a fleet of vessels. And when you had the downturn, the balance sheet was in pretty good shape. And when you had the downturn, what you realized was, good Lord, there's an off balance sheet liability for several ships that they have not yet taken possession of, but they were fully committed on to complete on a CapEx basis. And if this downturn in the oil price persists and we don't utilize what's now going to wind up being surplus equipment, we're going to mothball it. We're going to idle our old equipment. We're going to scrap it, which is exactly what happened. But all of a sudden, a balance sheet that looked pretty, pretty good look pretty bad when you had to finance equipment that you weren't going to use and you didn't have long-term contracts in place. So there saying, okay, we like this asset as a long-term investment. You know, they're, they're, they're in a, they're in a good industry, but there are other things I can do with capital. I mean, I could sell that and buy sub C seven, which has a pristine balance sheet. They're operating in a little bit different corner of the world. Sub C is an engineering construction company. And they'll take everything that happens with a topside gathering platform that an Equinor, which is the old stat oil, or Exxon Mobil, or any, any of the state oil companies would have, and do, do all of the engineering work that takes place below the surface. So all of the risers and flow lines and pipelines, everything down to the wellhead, they'll manage the field. But run by Christian Sam, the, the balance sheet runs generally with net cash. And you've got to be able to survive a downturn like that. And so even if you like the thing that you had, you don't want to get taken out on a stretcher. And, you know, I gave myself just as much upside with a swap of that position into something that not knowing how long that downturn would persist, we needed to live with it. And, you know, there the trade was a, th things like that are a good trade as well. So there's a lot of things that happen on the margin, but you're exactly right. To me, I think spending more time assessing not the upside case but the downside case and being constantly aware of changes in your industry, changes in the economic landscape serve to keep you out of trouble. You've got to live to fight another day. And, you know, just, just risk to me is not volatility. Risk is permanent loss of capital. And you don't want to have portions of your capital permanently impaired. 
And and you guys, just for listener context, um, you own about 30 names, so a concentrated portfolio. Are you guys long only? And is it uh, domestic only equities? Do you do any bonds? Do you do any derivatives? Do you do any shorting? I have one little account where we do some shorting, um, almost as a hobbyist venture. If, uh, if you get ready to admit that this is a Robinhood account, I'm not sure how, how to think about you at this point. No, no, it's a real account. It's a partnership account that I manage. It's about 10% of our assets. And I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't hold myself out to be a very good short seller. Um, yeah. No, we run very, and really, if you look at our 13F, we've got a bunch of holdings. The residual GE position, for example, um, some of that still exists in some family accounts, kind of hold them waiting for a step up in basis. I have new clients that come in and we get inherited positions that you know, oftentimes will work out of, but we keep some things for tax reasons. The, of, the, of the portfolio, we've got about 20% invested in internationally headquartered companies. And when somebody goes on to Datarama or pulls our direct SEC filings, my 13F, I only have to disclose per SEC regulation, three of the names. They're on a list of mandated disclosures, but six of my holdings, sub C7, which I just mentioned, we don't file on the 13F. And so I've got you know, a, fair, a fair amount of capital offshore, but it, it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long only all cap. I never wanted to be in a style box where somebody and consultants have tried to say that over the years. You know, you're really, you've got a lot of small mid cap. We don't want you owning anything internationally. You know, I just try to go where we can find value and durably, it doesn't matter to me whether you're headquartered in the Netherlands and you're an analog semiconductor company or whether you're headquartered in Silicon Valley, it matters not, you know, the, the, the business itself and the client list that they have and how they run their affairs matters a lot more. Now that said, I don't do emerging markets. I won't go where we don't think we have rule of law. I've been fairly public saying I would never ever invest in a Chinese domiciled company. Um, I think the, the, the game can get tilted away from you there. And so when I'm invested abroad, I'm in places like, uh, a lot in Europe, mostly in Europe. I've owned some ja some Japanese companies over the years. Governance there is an issue, but you know I've got Heineken in the portfolio, and I'm getting a lot of emerging market exposure and growth when they build a plant in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know I've seen Heineken in the years that I've owned it take a third of their operating cash flows up to two thirds of their operating cash flows in emerging markets. I'd rather have the exposure coming with a business that's growing abroad, but you're not going to lose the assets. Starbucks has. I believe a very long growth curve to open stores in China. They own their Chinese stores. They took them back from a Chinese venture from, from, from a Chinese partner. That the, the risk to me there is if you know you have a Chinese invasion of Taiwan not off the table with what you're seeing now with Russia and Ukraine. Um, you know, if we get really sideways in our Chinese relationships, there's a risk that our Chinese stores are gone and lost forever. You know, you've seen businesses write down and sell some assets now because they, they're completely out of Russia. You know, whether that's durably, um, uh, uh, you know, whether these companies are durably out of that market forever or not, who knows, remains to be seen. But you, I, you just don't want to have capital in a place where horrific things can happen. And yeah. a lot of that's noble in advance. Um, Alibaba is, if you own the ADRs, if you own the U.S. listed shares, you don't own the company. It's a, it's a V structure. You own basically a shell company in the Caymans. So you really do not have a claim against the equity capital of Alibaba. And, and they have proven to change the game midstream against you. And I just don't do it. I mean, I, I have way too many clients and families and family offices where we manage all or a substantial portion of capital. And again, I just don't want to blow it up. I mean, I'm, and, 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 and the trade off is not that we're sacrificing return, it's just, risk is permanent loss of capital and it's not volatility or short-term underperformance. It's trying right. to find durable earning power that's going to grow and that I can buy it at a cheap enough price to make a good long-term return. Well, uh, it's seemingly reading your letters. Um, let's see if we can find some of that. You know, you talk, uh, there's a quote you had where you said the last two years saw proliferation of speculative excess and charlatan promotion. Uh, I think your most popular tweet, if you search uh, all your tweets and listeners, if you're not following uh, Chris, he likes to mix it up. 
uh, was certainly calling out a uh, I don't know fund manager, SPAC issuer. I'm not sure what to call Chamath, but um, <laughs> also the one curious thing with with his letter, which I, I assume will be dropping next month uh, if he still publishes it. I don't know that I've ever seen an investment manager just publish gross returns. Have you ever seen that before? Is that a thing? Um, no, I've never seen it. I, I've never seen gross returns. You know, I call only. Them like, I mean, I've seen gross and net. Like that's very standard. You and I adhere to the the gold standard of our industry, which is the GIPS performance. And I don't know that I've ever seen that in my entire life. No, I've never seen it. No, I've never <laughs> seen it. And you know, comparing a series of, I guess, venture cap funds, one off, and aggregating them as though they're a single composite entity without disclosing the performance of each. And before you have liquidity events, where you can kind of game whatever your marks are over time, um, you know, I think ultimately, did, did the underlying investors make money? Who knows? But when you netted out what amounted to, Lordy, I think it was a 3% and something like 30% uh, performance fee, what, what appeared to be a low 30s return was more like an 18 return. I mean, and to not disclose <laughs> the net is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. And then the a... selectivity about... Uh, what triggered you the to... most was it that or the front page comparison to to the goat buffett like because that I, I, that had to have been like that it like all right not only are you going to do gross returns and all these other things but then here you're now going to take and say all right i'm, I'm going to compare it to warren and charlie <laughs> i feel like that would be like the final straw well i never would have read the letters i mean i i, yeah. I had clients interested in specs years ago and determined that the structure was pretty sleazy Great for the promoter, not so great for the, the the retail investor. I never would have read the letter had I not seen that comparison table. And only for the fact that I run when Mr. Buffett dropped the book value per share column in his first page of his chairman's letter, I, I run the whole 57-year history of Berkshire Hathaway's returns in the same format that they've run them. But I run them by year, and I run also... Uh, a year by year compound annual growth series, both forward and backward looking. So you can now see what the what the year to date return is, what the one year return is, three year return. And I run it for both book value per share and market value per share. When Chamath compared his return series to Mr. Buffett's, the number that left off the page was, and I've, I, it's been a year. Um, yeah. I think I think the Buffett return was like 12% compound. There was only one moment in the compound series forward or backward where the Berkshire return was 12 and percent. And that was using the stock price ending 1975 because it was down 49 and a half percent in 1975. Um, or 74, I guess it was 74. The bear market was 73, 74. Although Berkshire's, Berkshire rolled over later in that series. In any event, you know, returns had always been in the 20s, forward and backward. And then you had a big recovery two years later. And so that, that number leapt off the page. You wondered, well, how did you get to that number? And then he had labeled his time series as nine years. And it wasn't even nine years in his case. And Berkshire was actually 10 years to get to that number. And so he kind of miscounted whether it was a nine or 10. You just wonder, well, yeah. Having now read the letter, where are the auditors? Where's where are the internal compliance? Where's the SEC outside counsel? Because you're in the business now of raising money from retail. And I regret, I think, at some level being on Twitter, but the places where I've knocked heads with folks are a hundred percent exclusively where I think the retail investor is just getting shellacked and abused. Yeah. You know, if Goldman Sachs wants to go fleece a hedge fund, everybody in that world are big boys and big girls and know what you're getting and know what you're buying you know, you're, you're, you're professionals and you're trained to kind of ferret out the good, the bad, and the evil. But when you're fleecing the retail, and so I've tried to just kind of point out where platforms like Robinhood at the time of their IPO, um, I would never have commented on Kathy would had she not put out the Tesla report a year ago with a 3,000 
dollar stock price target, which was riddled with inconsistencies and impossibilities about some of the business lines they'd be in. I happen to know a little bit about insurance and auto insurance in particular, and to suggest that they were gonna be the number two or number three underwriter in auto within a five-year period of time was insane. And then to now come out in the last, I guess, last fall, and then even more recently, a couple of weeks ago, to suggest you're gonna make 40% a year, and then what's now 50% a year, that's just, that's, that's may, to use legal terms, may or could be criminally negligent. Um, yeah. you're just promoting. And uh, I, 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 I find the behavior appalling. We saw a lot of examples like that in the late 90s. We haven't seen it until this latest iteration. And so I've simply well, tried to the, raise awareness the, and a lot of people don't like me for it. But Well, you know, it's it a challenge because I, 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 in general, consider myself a very optimistic person. You know, I, I don't like being critical. It's easy to be on social media, but at the same time, as mentioned, there's a lot of garbage that goes on in our industry. And it's not, I don't think either of us trying to be holier than thou. It's just, we've seen this before and this bad behavior eventually gives us a bad name too. And it's not just, you know, the money management industry, but it's all of, to me, free markets and capitalism and everything surrounding it. And so, you know, it's, um, I think it's important to have people willing to speak up. You know, we, um, I was tweeting back in 2020, I said, you know, look at a lot of the historical research on SPACs. It's this entire series may be different, but historically post IPO, Luthold had it at minus 70%. I was like, I don't even know of a greater cash incinerator than that, that I can think of from a, from a structure, you know, and, and incentives, et cetera. And so maybe these will be different, but you know, it could not, it not be, but the two things about um, the examples you just gave that I think are, are strikes everyone is, is, um, feeling wrong is, is, it's like a, anyone who's existed long enough in the investment industry. I mean, look at your first example, talking about Ross, um, you know, has a, a degree of humility and understanding like what's happened in the past and what's possible. We all have the scars. We're all proud of the scars, you know, and I think in many ways, like we've all had losers, and we'll continue to have losers and make dumb mistakes. But to say some of the things that get said, like the 50% thing, we did a tweet last year. I said, well, I just want to see how many times this has actually happened in history, like in, in sectors or industries. And then Morningstar has done some uh, reports where they talk about how many times has an active manager achieved these numbers. And uh, the answer essentially rounds to never. Um, and so it's... Um, it's, it's hard to hear. It's like nails on the chalkboard. Uh, but, you know, what, what ends up happening in this cycle is, is probably the likely thing that happens in the cycle, um, which you talked about in the quote that kind of led into this entire discussion was, uh, you know, proliferation of speculative excess and uh, a lot of promotion going on. But here we find ourselves less than 10% down on the S&P, I think. Chris, what, give us a little review. Uh, you talked a lot about this in your, your letter of decomposing returns. Would love to hear you talk a little bit more about that. And if you have any more thoughts on what we just uh, uh, graced over, uh, feel free to continue to. Yeah, that, the, my only last comment, kind of tongue in cheek, very tongue in cheek, but maybe you and I could join forces as co-expert witnesses in some of the class actions that are inevitably coming well dude I've, I've i've reported a couple and i don't like doing this at all but they're so egregious where these marketing guys send me emails and they send these emails and i'm like look like do you realize who you're sending this to like you just first of all you just spam me so you lose all i feel like opt-out ability you spam me and then you sent me this and i'm like just to be clear is this true like exactly what you're claiming to be true You've never had a down year and you beat the market by two percentage points, but you charge 3%. None of the disclosures, like on and on and on and on. And they're like, yeah, it's amazing, right? And I was just like, oh my God. Like, and and twice I've had, I reported it where I can never say with 100% certainty, but probably 98% certainty that the track record is totally fictitious. Um, but in both cases, these are shops that are managing over a billion dollars uh, publicly. And, um, but to my knowledge, the SEC has decided to not look into either. So 
uh i i wash my hands of it and and so be it but it's uh it's uh it's it's hard to watch sometimes but it, i'm uh if you're listening and you're running something shady listeners whatever you do don't email me your uh your your pitch if, it, if it's sketchy because <laughs> i will done, I, I, i've done some expert witness stuff and good lord i won't i won't tell the whole story but there was a law firm that got sued for misplacing some securities but they'd been pledged as collateral in a re big real estate buy and turns out the securities that had been pledged was complete pump and dump um, pink sheet business that had no essential assets run oddly out of south florida but i was getting ready to say is it salt lake or vancouver i feel like half are out of those two locales, no it was salt sorry. lake but, but the company i'll tell you the name of the company and you could probably find some data. It was Vertigo Theme Parks was the security. Okay. And they were building this, they were going to build these theme parks kind of in the mountains outside of Bogota. And you did the demographics. There, there was not enough population to support it and wound up kind of pledging that they had capital raised from various entities around the globe. And we're talking about collateral and fixed income but they were using all the all the wrong nomenclature well the thing was a total fraud and this thing wound up actually going to a lawsuit uh did not get settled and i won't say who it was but the expert retained on the other side was the gentleman you can read about the story in maggie mayhar's bull book about the 19 late 1990s the bubble she'd been a baron's writer but the merrill lynch guy who ran whatever their science and tech fund who got on the bullhorn right at the top and said, let's get ready to rumble, kind of yelled that to the troops to fire him up. And you know, the fund was down 90% and blew up and he lost his job. But he was retained as the expert on the other side. And he premised that even though this thing was an absolute pump and dump fraud, it could have worked. <laughs> you know, so so we'll, I think we'll see some of that in the wake yeah. of the downturn. But you don't, you, don't, you don't get it until people are totally, totally blown up either. So it's well, it's kind you, of- you, you hit on that you hit on part and I was tweeting this as like, you know, this feels like someone who's been through the late 90s and 2000s on the wrong side as a university graduate right at that point. Um, but experienced it, it, it feels awfully similar. And, and, and I tweeted last year, I was like, you know, this feels like one of those times when you look around and a lot of these high flyers are down 50 70% and many of them are, but you still have the broad market generally holding up um you have a lot of the names despite being down still very expensive give us a lay of the land because you had a huge chapter on this listeners you got to go download the report at uh semper augustus what is it dot com is that y'all's website it is it is semper okay. augustus dot com um, semper augustus dot com download it grab a cup of coffee or wine or or a whole bottle because it's going to take a while it's 100 pages but there's a whole section on kind of decomposing returns you want to talk a little bit about that yeah the so I, you know knowing how the the degree to which margins have expanded you know warren buffett had a piece in fortune magazine back in i think the late 90s maybe 99 and he talked about market cap to gdp and talked about the the reversion the, the reversion mean reversion of margins and what's wound up happening is you have more and more of these capital light businesses and you've had a decline in interest rates so the interest burden lower even though leverage on balance sheets are high to where the profit margin has durably pushed higher it reached i think 8.9 percent in 1929 at the market peak kind of having average between three and six percent most of that time you just have this this, this bubble in profitability and a lot of aggressive accounting at the same time in the market peak in 2000, the margin got to seven and a half percent. And at that point, kind of Mr. Buffett had written three to six was kind of the normal range for profitability and it would revert back. Well, it really has not reverted back. It's proven durably higher. You have more of these big bellwether tech companies sitting at the hop, you know, at the top of the market that generate very high levels of profitability, very high returns on capital, capital light businesses. And so you have businesses like Microsoft, which had a 38% margin back in 2000, their business slow a little bit. And before they figured out the cloud and developed Azure, the margin dropped to 22%. Well, now it's back to 37%. So you have a lot of big businesses at the top. Apple's very profitable. 
And so kind of that Fab Five has really driven the bus. But broadly speaking, the overall market, the S&P did 16.6% a year for the 10 years into 1999. So I dissected the components that drive value. And it's a pretty simple formula. You have sales growth in dollar terms, any change in the share count. You have any expansion or contraction in the multiple to earnings. You have any expansion or contraction in the profit margin. And you have the dividend yield, which is added to that. So the first four are a multiplicative series. The last is a plus, is, is a plus whatever the dividend yield averages over that period. And what you had was just an enormous expansion. You had you had the initial multiple at 13 or 14 times earnings that ended at 23.6 uh, times. So, you know, up 80 plus percent, you had the margin expand from nine, which would have been kind of the upper bound of that mean reverting series wound up at 13.4%. So between those two series, you got over six percentage points of that 16.6 .6 out of the multiple expansion and you got 4% of it out of the margin. Most investors that I've asked the question of when I ask, how fast do you think sales for the S&P 500 have grown on average per year for the last decade or even the last two decades? And usually you get, well, I don't know, it's got to be six, seven percent. No, it's only three. You've had three percent growth in sales. And because we've had repurchases now uh, in place, that have consumed massive amounts of corporate profitability. We've driven the share count down over that 10 year period by about 7%. But as you know, and something I've been very active and vocal about my entire career is, is the dilution that comes from giving away. I mentioned the big tech giveaways in the late 90s and throughout the 90s, but on average, S&P 500 public companies give away 2% of their shares each year to executives and key insiders. And well, that was done largely through stock options in the early iteration. We've kind of changed the rules and they're less attractive now. And so we do more restricted stock shares, either performance shares or RSUs, but it's still a 2% giveaway. And so now you've got companies to the extent they're retaining earnings beyond what they pay in dividends. The dividend payout has averaged about 40% for the last decade. So the 60% of profits that are retained are not going into R&D. They're not going into growth CapEx. They're not going into expansion of the internal business. Um, they're going to buy back shares. And to the extent we've loaded up the collective balance sheet with debt, we've actually spent more than dividends and retained earnings buying back shares. So leverage relative to capital, leverage relative to assets, for corporate America is at an all time high. And we've done it to drive stock prices higher because if your CEO is on the job for four and four and a half years and they're getting a mountain of shares on the front end, their, their motivation often is to get the stock price up in the short term and not to think about 10 and 20 and 30 year investments you can make for the better of the business. So you had the share count during that 10 year period come in by about seven tenths of 1% per year. So you add it up, you add up the 3% growth in sales, you add up the seven tenths. And, 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 and I had several questions from the letter and I tried to make it clear in the letter and I don't think I did a very good job of it, but that change in the share count, when I talk about all of these factors being multiplicative, if your sales are growing by 3% a year, that's, 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 that, 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 that's a positive growth. You know, if it's, if it's 30% over three years, it's positive attribution factor. When your share count goes up as it did in the decade into 1999, and I can jump forward to that, it's not additive, it's dilutive. So if you, if you own 100% of a company and you increase your share count, you have a partner come in and the share count runs from 100 to 125, you now own 80% of the business. So it's not 25% growth that's positive and added to the return. It's a 20% dilution over whatever period of year. So that would be about a 2%. So if you've, if you've increased the share count like we did in the late 90s, that's, that's, that's dilutive to the owner, even though it looks like it's a positive on the math. So that, that's way deep into the weeds on the math of that. But, you know, so I said, okay, 16.6. So here you are with, Stocks having had one of their best 10-year periods of all time, 
only rivaled really by the 10 years ended 1999. And you have to ask, what's next? So, you know, you pull the typical investor and they're going to mark that 16.6 return that they just earned for the last 10 years. And that's now the expectation of future return. You saw the exact same thing in, in polls taken in the late 90s. People thought they were going to and, get and it's, 20%. And it's, it's true. Like you mentioned the, the, the polls of the late 90s. The polls the last couple of years, um, I, who was it? Schroeder's was one. We'll put them in the show note links because we tweeted them out. But you know, as re- the market kept going up, the polls just kept going up and up and up and, and top ticked, I think, around the 17%. Uh, rate recently, which is just like, you know, that there's, there's like your, your expert witness, there's a chance, uh, but it's a extremely slim one. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. So here we are with a profit margin at 13.4, a multiple at the mid twenties to earnings and sales that have grown at three and hindered by too much debt, really. I mean, we've not grown real GDP per capita by much in the last 20 years. We, we peaked on that measure in 2000. And forget about inflation. We have high inflation now. And I think if you get durably high inflation, the sales, nominal sales number can grow. So everything I'm going through here is in nominal terms. And you could get an adjustment up. So you really ought to be thinking about it in real terms. Inflation hasn't been much of a thing for the last 20, 30 years. And so you know, my mind still thinks in nominal terms, but regardless, whatever you think you're going to get in sales growth, adjust it by any increase or decrease in the share count, recognizing that when we have recessions and downturn, downturns, the share count balloons. You know, we had the financial crisis and the banks had to recapitalize. And so the share count for that decade ended uh, uh, the period 2008 um, was just brutal because the, the, the share count was off the charts. You recapitalize the entire financial system effectively, but you've really got to say, okay, now we're here with a dividend yield that's down to 1.3%. It's almost as low as it was in March, 2000. And it's not low because companies have cut their payout rate. It's low because the multiple to earnings and to peak earnings, the very high levels of, of profitability is so high. So you're starting at 1.3. So sales growth of maybe three, you know, three and a half offset by whatever the share count, 1.3 on the dividend, you can get to five between those two measures, between top line growth and the dividend that you're going to get paid. And then you have to come back to the le- the remaining two measures, and that's the profit margin, and that's the multiple. And you're starting at 13.4. I have a hard time believing we're going to durably drive profits much higher than they are today. Um And we can talk about the five big companies that have really driven the margin high at the top end. But, you know, I would, I would say you're not going to get much more. And I would say you're not going to get much more than a mid twenties to earnings. Okay. Interest rates being low, they're going to rise this year until we cripple the economy and have a recession. Then we're going to be back at zero at a point, but I don't think you're going to get much out of those two measures. And if you do, then you've got to say, well, how high and how much? So if you're going to run at 3% sales growth, you're going to run at a skinny dividend yield. To get to a 10% return, you've got to take the margin up to a high teens profit margin, or you've got to take the multiple north of mid 20s up to 30 or 31 or 32 to get to 10. So find me the chief investment officer of a pension fund endowment. Find me the, 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 the investment committee that oversees a family of mutual funds. And you know if you're in that seat allocating capital, and you've got a bunch of money invested in passive or in broadly diversified funds that are going to look and act like the duck that is the S&P 500, you've got, to, you've got to answer that question. And I think it's tough to get much higher. I would conjecture that we're more likely to have a period like what you saw after the 10-year run-up where stocks peaked in March of 2000. But I ran, just to keep decades consistent, I ran that 10-year period ended 1231.99. And you had a higher return. You had 18.2% return out of that decade, but you had a very similar experience. You had an expansion in the multiple from 14 or 15 times, doubled to 28 or 29. You had an expansion in the margin from mid fives to eight at that point. Um, 
and you had sales growth in dollars that were higher, but inflation was higher. I mean, sales growth in dollars were closer to six. But there again, to my point about the tech bubble, they hadn't figured out the sherry purchases. You were getting pretty diluted. The share count grew using the divisor for the S&P by about 25%. So you had that 20% dilution that I talked about. So that shaved two percentage points from the return of the shareholder. But you got seven plus points on the multiple expansion. You got four on the margin. Put it all together on a sales per share basis when you adjusted for the dilution, you were the same. You were three and a half percent. So even though you had higher inflation, sales per share, which is you do adjust the, the, the share count for the dollar sales, you can eliminate one of those measures. And you got to 18.2. So there you were almost at a bubble peak. Things continued rising until March of that year. Uh, the S&P really didn't fully start rolling over until September of 2000. But the decade that followed was abysmal. You had a loss of 10%. You lost almost 1% per year. And that's not cherry picking the market low. You could say, oh, well, you started off in January 1 of 2000. You know, you ran it through two big market downturns. You had the S&P 500 off 50% between 2000 and 02. Then it recovered back to 1500. Then it fell, obviously, in the financial crisis down to 666.66, oddly and kind of eerily, at the market low in February of 09. But if you ran it through 08, just through 08, you were off by 1%. Um, or if, if you ran it through 09, you were off by 1%. If you ran it through the end of 08, you were off by more like three percentage points per year. So it, 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 you had contraction in the multiple, of course, from high 20s to 20. You had contraction in the margin from 8 to 6 or 8 to 6.5. So you lost four plus points to the multiple contraction. You lost almost three points to the margin contraction. You, you had good, healthy sales and sales growth per share. You started off with a dividend yield that was 1.1% in March of 2000. Again, on a very high payout rate, but again, prices were so high that the dividend yield and the earnings yield, earnings yield minus the dividend yield is the retained earnings yield, um, was so low. So you couldn't have anything but a bad downturn. You had two nasty bear markets and you really weren't by the end of 09, which was a big recovery year. Stocks were up a bunch in 09. I mean, the, I, the funny thing though, if you talk about, if you talk to people, we did a tweet that it, it was all facts, like, like it wasn't even opinion, but we mentioned the dividend yield uh, as being almost as low as 2000. Wasn't quite there yet. I think you said what, 1.1? Um, yeah, and actually, actually on March 10, whenever the actually peak, you were mm -hmm. under 1%. I think you got okay. down to under one. We'll use like one. 0.9. But man, did people get ornery about that. Um, but let's, okay, you, you got to put on your hat, your blinders, your clown hat, wh whatever hat that uh, like maybe those like old school beer drinking hats with the tubes. And I say, Chris, 10 years out, you have to come up with a scenario where not only are returns 5%, but they're 10 what is that for the next decade? What is that scenario? Like what has to happen for uh, this thing to keep cranking for another 10 years? What, uh, what could it be? As remote as that might be, as a good analyst, you have to think about what's the possibility. And we used to joke that Elon Musk finds the, main, the moon is made of diamonds and there's wells of free energy. Uh, what could happen that, that actually is the opposite of what is most likely. Well, to my point on inflation, you're running nine on the CPI right now. I don't, I don't, I'm in the camp that says we're more likely to get long-term deflation as we work off an over-levered credit stock. You, you can't have 400 balance sheet, total credit market debt to GDP and expect a healthy economy. Um, we've absolutely put the brakes on the ability to grow the real economy. Um, but if we have durably high inflation or hyperinflation, I mean, hell, I mean, the Venezuelan stock market for the last few years has been the best performing stock market in the world. Mm -hmm. But holding inflation aside, you can adjust these numbers for whatever you think the inflation rate is. You have to expand beyond all time high record profit margins or a very robust multiple to earnings. Most of the time, the market's pretty efficient. And when you have that somewhat of a mean reverting series, and there is a mean reverting aspect to 
capital and there is a mean reverting aspect to margins. You, you, you would drive it higher because of kind of the nature of the capital light businesses that exist today. But if we have high inflation, we're gonna reset a lot of interest burden at a higher level. Um, still awful lot of commercial paper. There's awful lot of borrow short, lend long structure out there. A lot of financing at the very short end of the curve. Japan just said we're gonna buy again, unlimited amounts of treasuries, but there's a lot of leverage in the system financed at the short end of the Japanese curve. And so between here and there, if we have persistent inflation for a few years and the Fed executes on uh, a, a massive program of rising and raising interest rates, and their, their intent is to do so pretty heavy. I mean, Bullard just came out, our St. Louis Fed head here uh, yesterday, I think, and said, now we're talking about conceivably 75 basis points at a pop. Um, at a point, the Fed's got a perfect record of blowing up bubbles. They did it in 29. They did it in the late 60s. They did it in 2000. So we're, you know, we're trending toward that. And as they raise, especially if they shrink the balance sheet, like they tried to do from 2016 to 18. So hold all that aside. To, to get more than a mid-single digit durable return over, let's say, a 10-year period, you got to have margin or multiple expansion. I'm, I'm the under on that from an overall stock market standpoint. And if, again, you're chairing the investment committee or you're responsible for capital and you can't answer the question as to why profit margin should move higher. Now, I would say, if you look at the, if you look at the market through the lens of the amazing, amazing um, evolution of these big five companies that sit atop the market now, you read in the report, I, so I then wanted to apply how much of that 16.6% return came from the big five companies at the top of the market, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, and Amazon. You had that group that was about 8.5% of the market at the outset that finished at almost 25% over the course of 10-year period of time. Microsoft and Apple were already big players. Google and Amazon and Facebook were not very big yet. But the total return of those five stocks was almost 30%. I think it was 29.8%. And you roll through the attribution of each and you got what you expected in terms of um, kind of a, a, a multiple expansion. Your multiple, the stocks were cheap for the majority of the last 20 years, 10 years. Microsoft was cheap. Apple was cheap. Mr. Buffett got his big Apple position, got $36 billion into it at 12 times earnings. I got my basis into Microsoft, having sold it three or four years ago too soon at 10 times earnings. So you had, with that collective group, you had a multiple expansion from, from mid-teens, 14 and change, but up to 33. Apple trading at almost 30 to earnings. You've had just enormous growth in the business. I mean, sales were a little over 100 billion. They're pushing 400 billion now. They've bought back something like 40% of their shares outstanding just generating mountains of cash. But the stock traded from 11 to 30. Um, uh, margins didn't really budge. They were mid-20s 10 years ago. They're mid-20s today. But where you had growth in sales of you know, 17% a year, I mean, sales uh, you know, were up 200%. They grew 3x in dollars. You've got a law of large numbers now. You, you cannot repeat sales growth for an Apple to the extent. And I don't think you can get the same sales growth out of that group of five. So for the Fab Five, for these big five companies, you had 10% return out of the multiple expansion. But the real driver was sales growth. You had 18% of your annual return came from what was almost 400% cumulative growth um, in sales and dollars. And uh, to a company, you can go through. We can go through them one by one. You're starting at very robust now levels of profitability. You're starting at a very high multiple. You don't have that price margin of safety, and whether it comes from competition with each other, outside competition, regulation, simply, uh, you know, your, your end of product cycle. Who knows what it is but you're not gonna get the same sales growth. I, I, I think you take like an Amazon. Amazon was a smallish business. They were doing $50 billion in sales. Now they're doing $500 billion in sales. So they grew revenues by 10X over the decade. Um, they really weren't making any money. 
they, they had a margin of, you know, maybe 1%, one and a half percent at the outset. Now it's five. I'm operating under the assumption that the margin there will probably be 10 based on the mix of AWS and their first party and their third party marketing. So perhaps doubling from where it is, but the stock's trading at 70 times and now it's a mature business. So you've got a 70 multiple, you've got a margin that's likely to double. And I would say in that case, as that business evolves over the next 10 years, as you get ongoing continued growth, is it not going to trade at 70 times earnings? As the margin kind of grows into its mature margin structure, the multiple is going to come back. And so if you double the margin, but cut the multiple in half from 70 to uh, 35 or lower, and probably terminally, you know, much lower, um, you have a lot of headwinds in that group. You're, you're, you're not going to get 30% annual, annual returns, but again, you're not going to- What do you mean 30? Growth. What about 50? Come on, Chris, you're being so uh, despondent and bearish. We're, I, I'm looking for 50. Um, we did a, uh, there's an old great post we'll link to in the show note for listeners um, called uh, our friend Wes Gray at Alpha Architect called uh, Even God Would Get Fired as an Active uh, Investor that just kind of shows, even if you were like, had the perfect portfolio, and he, he even did it long short, you still experience these nauseating drawdowns and volatility and everything else. But all right, so we're set up for nothing good, probably less than average. What's your what's your estimate? So it's not 50%. What do, what do you think uh, the broad market does? Bogle would call this forecasting, but let's just call it expectations. So we can set expectations. I, I'm, I'm all about with my wife, with my everyone I know, Set a low bar so we can exceed it. But what, what do you think a uh, broad U.S. stock market does next? Take your pick, five, 10 years. Let's do, let's do 10, just because I've been playing with decades here and the work I did at year end. I would say uh, if inflation averages two, you'll get five best case. And with iterations of market drawdowns, not unlike we had from 2002 and 08, 09. So where you end precisely 10 years from today, I don't know, but um, you're going to have periods where the return's negative. It's negative today yeah. by whatever, eight, nine percent stands to be negative. Well, I, you're, I think, the, you're, the, you're the optimist on this call. I'm a, I, I tell you, it depends if you're a, um, a New Yorker. I don't know who eats the most donuts. I was going to say bagel or a donut in LA. What would we be having? I don't even know. Um, what, what a good analogy would be. Uh, but zero, I'm, I'm going zero real is my expectation. Uh, but we'll, somewhere between you, the optimist, and me, the pessimist, uh, it's certainly not 50. Is my no, guess. that's my high side. My high side is five. Okay. I, I, think, <laughs> I think you layer in some margin contraction. You know, say you run back to nine or 10 um, from 13.4. I thought we traded at the peak in the third quarter of 2018. And you know, here we are running record profits, but a lot of that's just pull forward of demand from the pandemic and the low interest burden and companies have learned to live with less labor for the moment. But inflation is going to take a wicked hammer to corporate profitability if it persists for another 12 months or 18 months. You're going to see much, much lower levels of profitability. But I think I, I would, I, I, I'm, I'm the under on a 13.4 profit margin, and I'm absolutely an under on a 24 multiple to peak earnings. So yeah. you dial those back and you easily get to zero. So I'd, I'd really, you know, be but I like being Pollyanna. You finding opportunity though, it sounds like. Uh, tell me tell me what, uh, what looks good to you today. Um, uh, we have some overlapping names uh, as well, which I always like to see. But as a quant, I'm like, I'm, uh, I often don't, have any familiar like familiarity can't talk today with uh with what the companies actually do which is um the opposite of you which does uh who does deep dives on these companies so what looks good to you here in uh 2022 q2 oddly quite a bit um I'm doing a lot of buying with cash flows and uh cash on hand and deposits we've got new clients coming in the door um i've got a portfolio trading a little over 12 times um, so half the market multiple, um, largely unlevered balance sheets. And so for that, we've got returns on capital of the businesses that we own, which are very lightly levered, where our return on equity of our portfolio holdings is almost the same as the return on capital. That's, that's how averse we are to debt in the capital structure. 
things are cheap as you know, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but Berkshire with the meeting coming up next week sits at the top of the portfolio. It was trading at 13 to earnings and change as I jumped through all of my earnings assumptions. And, you know, Mr. Buffett just takes it uh, on the chin from the media and the naysayers and everybody, you, you've seen charts, well, he's underperformed for 10 years, underperformed for 20 years. So I just ran with the stock up 17% this year and up 29% last year. I ran my forward and backward CAGR, so updated through the end of the quarter. And just for all of the uh, boo birds in Berkshire Hathaway land, Berkshire's stock has now outperformed the S&P. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm updating the quarter. And so I, I haven't run exactly four quarters, but I've got my annual numbers for each year back over the last 23 years. Berkshire's now ahead for one year because we're up 17, the market's down. Let's see, the S&P was down 4.6% for the quarter. It's down more than that today. Um, Berkshire was up 29.6% uh, last year. So it beat the market by a point or two. So the one year is now ahead. The two year is now ahead. The six year is ahead. The seven, eight, nine, 10 are ahead of the S&P 500. The, 10, the 12 years ahead and everything from 15 years on going backwards is ahead. Um, so, and it's still cheap. Uh, Which is amazing I, because the S&P hasn't really reverted. Like it's still near all time highs. Well, it, you know, it's funny what you're talking about because um, we wrote an article years ago uh, called how to beat 98% of all mutual funds. And, and the example we gave was Berkshire 13 F stocks, right? Pretty simple stuff. You could actually use Berkshire, the stock. They're the same historically, very, very close uh, roughly. But, um, but Berkshire should meet, beat the market by three to 5%, I would guess per year from year end. In fact, it, it, one of one of Mr. Buffett's big critics, and I won't name names, but I offered up a bet on Twitter, bracketed by whatever the guy wanted to take, anywhere from a steak dinner, nice bottle of Bordeaux, up to a two comma bet, mm -hmm. and I didn't get a response on it, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, he had pointed Who's, out. I don't even know, like who could even be anyway. Let's not get into that part. But my, my wife um, was my wife was not thrilled when I made that bet in a public <laughs> forum. But but so well, I it's did, not I, I, I could structure it like Ted Seide's bet and not yeah. actually post a million. You know we, you know we could discount it to the present yeah. value of ten. Well, I don't I don't know how well the zero coupons would work out in in this situation. You'd be in, I, uh, uh, Berkshire in, would have to be the pony. I mean, you right. just you'd have to just agree we're just going to put our money in Berkshire in an escrow account. And yeah. run it at a ten percent discount rate, and so put up, you know, a third of, a little over a third of the money, forty well, percent of the money. Th this is going to depress you because I did a tweet, as I love to do tweet polls, uh, and they always trigger me because I already know the answer what it's going to be. But I, but I hold out hope. But I said, what stretch of underperformance by a portfolio manager would you be willing to tolerate before selling the allocation? Um, over half said less than three years which is just like everything wrong in our world. Another third said three to six years. And the example I gave, I said, was with, with this Berkshire situation. But I said, there's, look, he's crushed the market by plenty forever. Um, but in, in this example I wrote, which was a year or two ago, I said, you know, there's periods where he underperformed like on a year, year over year basis, just looking at years like 11 out of 17 years, which if you go back, there's a bunch of Vanguard research on active managers. If you outperform, like all of us go through periods where it's, you know, multiple years in a row or periods where it underperforms. That's just the, the noise and the statistics. And I was like, you can single-handedly buy Berkshire or buy the stocks and beat 98, 99% of mutual funds. But the disconnect is this fact that people are unwilling to hold something even a couple of years when it's underperforming, which is the entire price of admission, right? Like that's the whole point is you have to sustain these periods and which is why it drives so much bad behavior on and on. Uh, anyway, end of rant. Well, no, you're spot on. We had, from, from a personal standpoint, you know, we had navigated that 
bear market in 2002, well, I mentioned we made something like 30% and lost, lost almost as much as the market in 02. So the first two years that we made just a bunch of money in 2001, but the S&P fell by half and we made money. In 08, we were down by half of the market decline, 20 against 40, beat the market in 09, 10 was behind by a couple of points, and then 11, we were up like seven against two. So at the end of 11, I, I've got a, the reason I, these numbers are so off the top of my head, I wrote it, it was in my letter this year. But at the end of 11, you would have said we were genius because our one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, we were so far ahead of the market. Our compound return at that point was 11.8% on our stocks, no cash. We have clients that have different cash levels, but our stocks had averaged 11.8 and the market had done something like 1.8 or 1.9%. We then had a four-year period starting in 2012, 12, 13, 14, we averaged about 10, but the S&P was doing 22% a year for that three years. And so all of a sudden, even some of my longstanding clients were wondering what's going on. You know, this is three years. This is kind of crazy. You guys, are you losing your touch? And then in 2015, the fourth year in a row, we were down 10. Berkshire, my largest holding was down 12 and a half. And I really had some restless natives. I mean, people were genuinely concerned that we didn't know what we were doing, that Berkshire didn't know what they were doing, that Mr. Buffett had lost it. And yet at the end of that, that what was now 15-year period, 16-year period, we'd still crush the market by a whole bunch, but that four years was trailing badly. And then because we were down that 10, we had made 4%, let's call it on average for four years when the market did like 15%. That was when I wrote up Berkshire for the first time because I wanted our clients to see how we analyze the business beyond talking to them just generally about valuations. And I wanted them to see the thought that went into how we analyze the companies that we own. And so I wrote it up and went through all the valuation yardsticks and some of the parts and all the ways that I get to what I think the business is worth. And we wound up, a friend of mine, Joe Coster, convinced me to put the letter out in the public sphere. We decided at that point, we'd love to raise some institutional money. We were never in the databases. We wound up doing our GIPS composites, took several years to do it. But our portfolio was absolutely being given away. Berkshire was absolutely, absolutely nearly as cheap at, at the end of 15 as it had been in a long time. And since then, you know, the letter's out and we've got some notoriety for it. But we've just, and we're so far ahead of the market. But, you know, even at the end of last year, um, we were up, I don't know, stocks were up 25, 26, 27%. So we were a couple points behind the S&P. There are a couple of guys on Twitter that had just said, you know, we were idiots. I mean, just terrible money managers. So if you link my whole return history, we've now made about 12% a year on our stocks. The S&P's averaged 7.8. And... Even if you throw in what's been probably 15% cash, because I've got foundation accounts that are giving away money 5% every year, you know, we're still two points ahead, even with all the cash in the portfolio and net of fees. If you looked at my return, and so, so endpoint sensitivity matters. The reason I was willing to go throw out those Berkshire numbers is they've just crushed it in the last one or two years. But if you take a year when you're way behind or two years when you're way behind, it's gonna make some durable portion of your backward looking returns look pretty poor. So my 10 year was no good. My 12 year was no good. Um, five and six, I was fine because after 15, we had beat the market by a bunch. Berkshire started kind of recovering and outperforming again, but you know they, had, they, they looked really bad for 10 years. So I've now got, we're up, I don't know, 12% for the year, something like that, 11% for the year, market's down, Berkshire's up 17. I've got some energy stocks that that have really kind of moved things ahead. Well, I, I was going to make cheap. I was going to make you sing your intro, the the brown sugar uh, uh, rendition you have, and put that as your Chris's karaoke intro to the episode. Listeners, you'll to get the joke, you got to download his letter. But um, I need but, to get somebody that can carry a tune. To, yeah, to um, you know, energy is is a fun example and, and you can talk about the thesis there but but kind of tying a bow on what we're just talking about you know so many investors and you and i were joking about calpers leading into this and so I, I i'm not just talking about retail this is equally uh as important for institutions and we see this 
all the time. And all the academic research shows that uh, many of the people heading up a lot of these institutions are as bad, if not worse, at this process, which is chasing managers, uh, piling in after they've had a hot return, and then selling them after they do poorly. And one of my favorite things I tell investors over and over, they hate to hear. I'm like, look, if you're going to allocate to an active manager, could be quant, could be uh, discretionary or an asset class or anything like 10 years to me is the minimum, like to, to even get any statistical interesting output. And, and honestly, in many cases, it's actually only going to be evident at, at the fullness of uh, even longer than that, you know, 15 years, perhaps even 20. And no one wants to believe that, right? They want the the Robin Hood returns now. Uh, they want them uh, to be certain. And, you know, that's just not how any of this works, you know, in, in, in my opinion. So a lot of the market beating returns is being in the investments when they're out of favor as well. And, and that's a hard part. And energy, you know, I think it may have been one of my favorite examples of the last, uh, my career, but even the last decade on, on when it ticked what like two percent of the s p or something a couple of years ago just Less. astonishing you're just just north of one maybe one and a half percent in oh october goodness. of 2020 yeah um all right so uh take your pick you can take this in any direction you want your portfolio we we're on the topic of berkshire or we can talk about energy or anything else uh any of these other gems you got hiding in there well i think energy is so fascinating today Broadly speaking, I've got it. I've got the, the, the brown sugar section, which is which is mm -hmm. energy. It was also a tribute to Charlie Watts, who had passed away. I've been a Stones fan since I was knee high to a grasshopper, my absolute favorite band of all time. And we lost the first of the band, even though the oldest, he was he was not the first that I thought would pass, but we lost Charlie last year. So I want to do something with a tribute to the Stones. We have seen in energy and in some of its peripheral industries, I've got a a big holding in Olin, which is a commodity chemical company here. Disclosure, we own it too, listeners. So keep going. So the, the capital cycle will, will it just, just creates enormous wealth and then it destroys it. You have, you have a, a, a period where things are washed out and nobody's making any money. Capital disappears from the space. You go through restructurings. The creditors become the equity owners. It's hard to form capital. Nobody wants to build, expand. And all of a sudden you get a shortage and you, everybody starts making money and that draws more capital and more capital and then you overbuild. The energy sector is famous for doing that. The chemical industries are famous for doing that. We earlier in the conversation talked about the period leading up 2015 when Chevron and Exxon were spending $40 billion on exploration and CapEx. And today they're spending half that. You've got a discipline now in place and you've got a scarcity in place that's really, in my mind, being driven by ESG, being driven by the European Greens toward essentially eliminating fossil fuels. I think there's a, a, a not small corner of the world that thinks we can do that, and we cannot do that. But rightly, we are doing what we had started doing under the Carter administration that we should have done more, and that is figure out a way to get cheaper wind and cheaper solar and to do it in scale. Now we're doing it on massive scale. Berkshire Hathaway's three utility operations, MidAmerican, Pacific Corp, Nevada Power, have 50% of their electrical output is now originated by wind, solar, hydro, some geothermal, way ahead of anybody else in the field. And so, but we're creating scarcities by, by making the notion of exploring for oil and refining it a dirty concept. And Europe has led on this front. We're seeing divestitures of invested capital we're seeing divestitures of refineries. We've seen the number of refineries in Europe over the last 20, 30 years cut by 40%. The productive capacity of their refineries cut. In the United States, we've gone from 250, let's call it, down to about 127 refineries. But in the US, we've at least taken the remaining refinery stock 
an added capacity over the last 30 years commensurate with population growth. You, you can't not have refined crude. You think about what happens to a barrel of unrefined oil. Of course, we make gasoline. Almost 50% of what gets refined is gas. And we still have an enormous ice fleet. And we could talk about the rate at which we'll have EV penetration. It's going to be way longer than people think. And I'm not sure. I don't know, man. We're doing this. We're do doing it. this during uh, Tesla's call. I'm I'm sure their projections are. It's it's happening as we speak. So we yeah. We Ka- may... You know, they the Arc's got them doing 20 million vehicles. I think um, in five years, and it's would be matching uh, Volkswagen and um, Toyota's combined market share, which is pretty spectacular. In any event, um, we're not going to build another refinery in this country. We're not going to build another refinery in Europe. And not only that, so I own Holly Frontier and Valero. Uh, We bought them for the first time in March of 2000 for what amounted to between one and two times kind of normalized mid-cycle cash flow. Nobody wanted to own these assets. Um, And what's happened, even in both those cases, and they're both low-cost refiners for different reasons. Holly, which just acquired Sinclair. So now they've got some downstream operations, which is great. It gives them some diversity, but their, their core refineries are inland refineries, proximity to places like Cushing. So they have very low cost supply of light, sweet, crude pipeline system to have delivery. They're marketing in the West, which is a growing region. But even there, they're converting uh, two of their refineries just converted Cheyenne to renewable diesel. They're converting one of the por- portion of their New Mexico properties to renewable. Valero is doing the same thing. California is phasing out the ability for a class eight tractor to run on conventional diesel. So now we have this renewable diesel, which is essentially taking uh, agricultural byproduct and running it through a, a, a unique refinery that creates the chemical equivalent, if you will, of regular diesel oil, d- diesel fuel runs the same, does not wear on the engine any differently. It gives you the same output, the same same energy output. Um, but unlike a conventional refiner that makes kerosene and gasoline and all of the distillates, so diesel, jet fuel, asphalt, all of the feedstocks for uh, the chemical industry, propylene, ethylene, all of that, asphalt, tar, waxes, lubricants, everything we use and everything we need comes from refined oil. So you're not going to have it, but now we have a scarcity. So here we are today with a very high oil price. Even prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we were pushing $90 on oil. Um, And we've got shortages. So usually if you're a refiner, and I guess we've gone down the path of refineries, if you're a refiner and you have very rapidly rising front end feedstock cost, if the price of an unrefined barrel of oil rises rapidly, typically the prices of your end product, finished goods or just the various asphalt that comes out, the various distillates that come out, typically those don't rise as fast in price. And so a refiner typically has compressed margin spreads and refining is a spread business. The price you pay for your feedstock, versus the price at which you can refine and sell your end product for. That's not the case. We have a shortage on the back end because now we're taking literally, we've closed three refineries in California. California is like Germany. They've lost their absolute minds on the energy front. They think we can actually not have energy or or at least we're not gonna make it in their state. So all this refined diesel is flowing into California, but it's shrinking the refining capacity of everything else we need as a society and we're not gonna build it. It's just absolutely insane. And so last year, Holly bought a refinery from Shell because the European majors are dumping assets because they've got a gun to their head from a policy perspective to shed their dirtiest of assets. Nobody in Europe wants to own a refinery. And so they sold their Puget Sound refinery, which is Anacor to Washington, halfway between kind of Seattle and Vancouver, to Holly Frontier for about $550 million. But when you net out the inventory, both the unrefined, crude, and all of the finished product that sits sits in their various storage facilities and their pipelines, when you net it out, they paid $350 million 
for an asset that averages about $250 million in cash flow per year. So not much more than one times cash flow. Break evens are not very long when you're paying one times cash flow. And now you own a scarce asset. And now you've got proximity to bring in unrefined crude from Canada by rail and also by ship and take care of the California marketplace, which has lost its mind. Um, you've got those scarcities across energy. Olin's a special case, which I'd be happy to drill into if you want to a little bit. It feels like an entire decade of uh, narrative in just the last two months has has had a massive shift. And it, it'll be uh, curious to me to see the repercussions on how policies do or don't change. And, you know, there certainly seems to be a shift on nuclear, but uh, the European continent, um, you know, is is certainly feeling a lot of the effects of uh, what's going on and who knows how this is all going to play out eventually. Um, but I had to ask you, did Rockefeller end up investing? Cause they didn't like your, uh, <laughs> your energy focus. Uh, did you, did you like respond to him this year and been like, so do you want to revisit? <laughs> no, we didn't get Pat. Maybe I should figure out and call her back. Um, yeah. You read about it in Jim's thing, but yeah, yeah. I had a call from Rockefeller foundation curious about investing perhaps with us, but the mandate would have been that we would have had to sell all of our energy investments, not simply not own them for their portfolio, but across the board. And I thought, geez, that's, um, weren't you guys the old standard oil? I mean, this is kind of a crazy ask, well, but I tell you, we have, we, 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 we have some folks, um, in that are very climate sensitive, um, that are, uh, very interested, I think, in hiring us. Uh, and it would, it would have been the last group on the planet I ever would have thought uh, would be interested in hiring us. But they thought the comments and grants and they thought my letter was interesting. And, and these are kind of really kind of die hard for years and years. They said no fossil fuel, no fossil fuel. And I think perhaps for my letter and some of the conversations, they've realized that we need to do all this thing in harmony and in concert. And yes, we're going to go down the path of more renewables, and we should, but you've got to do it in a way that's still helpful and, 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 and uh, helpful to the citizenry and the planet. I mean, you can't create scarcities that drive the price up of, of trying to live. Um, if you're Germany, you can't go from 17 nuclear plants to three at the moment. They close three on January 1. They're supposed to close another three. We'll see. But the political machine there, Schroeder was, I believe, on the Gazprom board. Um, politicians go into office poor as dirt and they come out rich as titans and we have to stop that so we still have political motivation it, it'll be interesting because what's happened is we, we've exposed how how absolutely reliant upon russia europe and particularly germany is it'll be interesting what happens with the second gas problem um, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline which was gas ready to go a lot of politics involved. We've got politics with some of our leadership and some of the folks in the energy patch in Ukraine. Who knows why we go to war and who knows why we do what we do, but there was a lot of pushback on Russia essentially doubling the capacity of, of gas that flows out of Russia into Europe, bypassing Ukraine and Poland. Ukraine gets a tax of about $3 billion a year, where if you run uh, gas um, directly under the Baltic into Germany. They're not collecting that tax and that toll. But, you know, they've spent something like $10 billion, they being the Germans, closing their nuclear capacity. And this is, nuclear is the most efficient source of power on the planet. And it, it's stunning to me that as we transition to renewables, where you have to create and build so much more productive capacity with wind and solar, because they're intermittent sources of power. The wind does not blow and the sun does not shine 24 hours a day. When the sun's in the Southern hemisphere and you're in Northern Germany, what are you doing with solar? I mean, that's just crazy. Um, and the cost of doing so, the cost of replacing all of our coal, all of our natural gas, which you can't do, but going to a wind and solar and, and, and hydro grid, and not have nuclear doesn't work. 
the cost of replacing just our fossil fuel, or just replacing coal, uh, is something like four to eight trillion dollars just in the U.S. You, you'd, you'd run that at a factor of six to try to do it worldwide, and you can't do it. The the replacement of wind and solar against a nuclear plant, for example, you've got to have four to you know, let's call it let's call it at least double, if not four x the productive capacity again because it's it's an intermittent source of power, and because the grid has to be constantly fired. You either have to have industrial scale battery backup, which we do not yet have, or you've got to have not only a peaker plant, a peaker natural gas fired plant that can plan for seasonally periods where you need power, where you know you're not going to get it from the sun or from uh, planning more for the sun, not, not so much from the wind. But, but on days when it's too cloudy, you have to have constantly fired grid. And so you need natural gas always on hand under every single solar and gas field. And I've got a section on how carbon intensive it is to build solar panels and to build the big industrial wind turbines, both on and offshore and how much steel and how much cement and how much quartz and all of your mined uh, uh, minerals go into that. And, where those exist and how dirty they are. 90% of our solar panels are built in China because you can't do it without running coal. You need the heat. You, you've got to have rare earth metals. And so the Greens have totally lost their minds and they're pushing us down the path. And I think maybe they'd be okay if we go back to horse and buggies. But if you want to actually live and fly and drive and do it in a, in a, in a, in a reasonably quick period of time, but not do it so fast that you create dangerous scarcities, then there's a middle ground. And for that, Valero and Holly are good corporate citizens. Uh, Berkshire's the best corporate citizen, extant. Um, again, they lead on the renewables front far away. They're getting paid for it. I mean, you wouldn't do it if you weren't gonna get paid for it. So getting enormous tax credits to build out wind, they're gonna build a lot more wind through 2024. Um, in Olin's world, again, you can't not have uh, the two components that come out of the chloralkali process. You've got chlorine and caustic soda on both sides of the molecule. Olin's the ver is, is the lowest cost on, on both sides. They're vertically integrated. When they picked up a bunch of assets from Dow, when Dow and DuPont merged six or seven years ago, they loaded up the balance sheet with some debt, but they got the epoxy business. They got a vinyls business. And so they're vertically integrated. So everything from pulp and paper on the caustic soda side of the equation to paints, marine coatings. On the epoxy side, wind turbines are gonna have epoxy at the interior part of a wind blade. You've got carbon fiber because it's lighter on the outside of the blade. You want purified water, you want bleaches. You gotta have all of these commodity chemicals and Olin and their competitors, Westlake, Huntsman, um, are not building more capacity. These competitors are not going to build more capacity. They've played the commodity cycle too long that they don't want to go through another downturn where you jeopardize the health of the corporate balance sheet and the durability of ownership. And so they've been collectively kind of taking their lowest margin product off the market and closing supply, even in a hard market where prices are recovered. So I mean, Olin traded down to 10 bucks a share on 160 million shares outstanding. Our basis center is in the low teens. So I was paying a market cap of $2 billion for a company that this year is doing over $2.6 billion in EBITDA and will do so durably. So the stock's now traded at $60 this morning. So we've made a big gain, but I'm buying Olin at a few points below where we are today because I think a portion, and I hate to say it, and I'll be on the record for time immemorial, but a portion of the capital cycle has been repealed because we genuinely have capacity, we, we generally have capacity constraints in place and we have some level of rationality. And so they've cleaned up the balance sheet, they've paid down a billion and a half of their debt and they're just minting money. I mean, they're just minting money. They'll, they'll, they, they, they could take the, at, at the current bid, on their current share repurchase, if they reauthorize it every year, they could take the company private in four to five years. The stock's that cheap. 
it's still trading at such a low price. And again, a rationality in places that you have not seen rationalities. And you can very much apply that to different pockets in the energy world. It, the luxury yeah. that we have is, is a lot of people don't want to own this stuff. I mean, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, if they're going to force big institutions to sell their energy holdings, great. I mean, bring them on because... Music music to my ears. Um, Chris, we've held you for a long time, but I, I can't let you go without at least talking about Berkshire. The meeting is coming up. You mentioned they're having a nice fat run. Listeners, download Chris's letter to get a really deep dive on all things Berkshire. Um, but a couple of quick questions on it. These guys are about to, to cross over into the hundo club in age. Charlie just doing laps with everyone and his recent trading at the daily journal, um, you know, and, uh, has, has been still at his spry old age, uh, causing waves, uh, everywhere. Give me a fair value. Berkshire is having a big year. What's a, what's a, what's a, what do you think, uh, this stock should be at? And then I want to get to a harder question for you, which is, uh, circling back to the beginning of the discussion, when would you ever sell it? What's what would be the criteria for uh, for you to uh, kick this sucker out of your portfolio? Yeah, broadly speaking, if you take kind of the and you've read my letter, so I use a sum of the parts analysis where I kind of value each of the main sectors in the business, the utility operation, the railroad, the manufacturing service, retail and what's now finance business, a few assets, the holding company and then the juggernaut, which is the insurance operation run that number. I run a um, income statement adjusted, gap adjusted financials for a lot of accounting uh, hoops you've got to jump through to kind of normalize the profitability of the business. And then the more conventional price to book and old Mr. Buffett's old two prong valuation method. You know, if you kind of put them all together, fair values north of a little over $900 billion market value, which makes the math easy on the A shares. You're just over 600,000 and on the B shares, just over 400. And I hate it when it's kind of between and you got to do that difference on the 1500 share differential and easy math when it's 900 billion, 600,000 and 400 bucks a share, a little bit, little bit north of those numbers. Um, on valuation, uh, I'm probably going to shake out kind of similar to what you're going to wind up seeing on the repurchase front having bought back something like $60 billion in Berkshire shares over the last couple, two and a half, three years, um, 27 and $24 billion per year. As the stock has run up late last year and early this year, you see the cadence of repurchases slowing. You're trading at about 150% of book value, a little under 150% of book value now, which is as expensive as the stock has been over the last year and a half. I think it's worth more um, but again, it's opportunity cost. So whether it be in the Semper portfolio or whether it's Mr. Buffett sitting in the captain's chair and thinking about how to allocate Berkshire's $28, $29 billion kind of in, in cash coming in the door each year, um, I think Berkshire at the, at the present bid relative to the acquisition offer they just made for Allegheny at 11.6 billion relative to the 8 billion they just added to the oxy position now in common where they had the preferred position. I think you read, I think you run what you can earn on Berkshire's share at the current bid versus those two deals against repurchasing the stock. And those were better deals. So you know, that's that's a place for $20 billion. They'll con continue the pace at which they're spending CapEx in the energy oper in, in the energy operation in particular. Um, since they've owned MidAmerican and then the other utilities and, and distribution assets here and in the UK and in Canada, they're spending $2 in CapEx for every dollar in depreciation. And that cadence won't slow anytime soon. The wind build out. Some of that has run its course. They've been very heavy. The state of Iowa now has more of its power produced by wind versus any other state in the country. And that's Berkshire, MidAmerican leading there. They're spending a lot in the Northwest with Pacific Corp. The solar investments are going to come for tax policy starting after about 2024. So I think some of the, unless they change 
um, unless they change the incentives, the tax incentives, uh, solar is going to be more favorable in a couple of years. So Berkshire's really been focusing on the wind side of that equation. But that's, you know, the ability to retain four billion dollars in profit and lever it up with four billion dollars in debt, which is kind of how utilities are appropriately structured, kind of a even mix between equity and debt capital. There's a lot of growth capex there. So, you know, if you're Buffett, if you're Mr. Buffett, you've 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 got to figure out what to do with twenty-five to thirty billion dollars per year without eating into the cash uh, in the business. Um, they're out of the game of trying to elephant hunt for the time being, control positions in big businesses. Nobody's gonna sell their company to Berkshire today at a price that makes sense to Berkshire. Um, private equity will pay far richer sums because they're not trying to own assets for 30 years. They're trying to, they're trying to arbitrage multiples and do what private equity does. Venture cap, I think, is going to get re-rated pretty spectacularly thanks to declines and things like the ARC portfolio and the level of um, valuation uh, tranches. Um, I think some of your some of your investors in venture cap are in for a surprise. So I have uh, I've got a foundation that gives away uh, five percent of their capital and. Uh, earlier, just a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, we gave away some Berkshire shares um, on a tax advantage basis because uh, it, it was it was it was at the point where it had run up in size. And there's there's an account that wants to limit the Berkshire position itself, and because Berkshire doesn't pay a dividend, and it earns at least ten on equity, probably more when you objectively account for the stock portfolio more appropriately. Berkshire really earns more than the ten that I conservatively get to in my letter. So I have trimmed it back, but I'm, I'm actively buying it. Cash is coming in and we're, we're new clients and clients are underweight. All right. So I've let me give you at, a, I've bought it at the current bid. So let me give you a scenario. This is the price-based scenario. All right. Value has its moment. Like plenty of us are expecting it to. The expensive stuff uh, continues to get whacked like it has been. The, the cheap stuff continues to do well like it has been. We have a similar situation where you have a flight to quality and so berkshire goes from you know where it is called a price book 1.5 or whatever whatever um let's say it goes up to 750k a share is that a sell point or a million because those are totally within the realm of possibility this cycle alone just from this value trade berkshire's traded at these multiples before not sometimes not really since the the 90s but certainly there's been periods where it's it's uh hit around two on a price to book as an example but 750 a million what would cause you to clean house on the entire position at 750 very near term time horizon wise uh it will be a smaller position in the semper portfolio at a million in the very near term it would be a much smaller position but you know, I've got different constituents as clients, and I'm much more readily willing to shrink an overvalued or even a fairly valued Berkshire in a non-taxable setting than I am in a taxable setting. Right. Um, taxable investors, as long as we don't get a change in the tax code, you know, you're always looking for the basis step up at death, and that's kind of a macabre lens through which to think about things. Simple but, answers, Chris. We just got to get you to launch an ETF. There we go. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's on the table for tax well, reasons. S T A N. We could do that ticker. Bloom is Bloom. Bloom is no B L O M. Uh, we could do that. Uh, T U L P. Tulip. Yeah. S E M P R. I'll start reserving some of these for you. Um, so there are those that that on Twitter that would maybe want it to be full F O O L. But but that's the beauty. So this is, this is what Dunce, I tell people. Uh, Dunce is five. Um, this is what I tell people. And it's it's the beauty of being a public fund manager. We get all the haters on Twitter and elsewhere. And I love them. I embrace them because I say, you know what? <laughs> you think I'm an idiot. You think I'm the dumbest portfolio manager. People love to, we have 12 funds. So something is always not working. People love to post charts over whatever period and say, look how much you idiot are. And I just love to say, I hope you were short please short my funds because it increases the volume and the liquidity. And I'm totally happy if you think I'm an idiot that you should short all my funds because I'm on the other side of that trade and God bless you if you make money from it and you get to play it out. See, 
you can't short a lot of the hedge fund managers out there. You can't short certain mutual funds, ETFs you can. So that's the beauty. Uh, I'll take it. All right. We got to do like two more questions and then wrap this up. This has been a blast. Um, uh, this is going to take the record for longest conversation, but also one of my very favorites. Um, outside of the price target, what would cause you to sell Berkshire? Um, you know, to me, I'm trying to think of anything and it's, it's a tough argument because a lot of the criteria, but uh, as an analyst, you got to think about these sort of things, PM. Um, what, would, what would cause that uh, uh, to, to be a, a sell for you, for you? From an operational standpoint, there have been some businesses bought in the manufacturing service retail group where prices paid were so sufficiently high and you didn't have any kind of growth margin of safety in those businesses um, that you really began to wonder whether the acquisition machine of buying control positions in large businesses, precision cast parts being a great case in point. Um, I owned a little bit of precision, had bought it at a lower price, would not have paid the price that Mr. Buffett paid for it. Um, and the energy world had rolled over. So you knew, the, you knew the turbine business was already in trouble. You would not have predicted what was going to happen with aircraft manufacturer and that side of precision's business. But I've got, and I've gone kind of back and forth, but I've highlighted in my letter, the, there was for a long period, really back to you know, 20 plus years ago, an aggregated balance sheet and income statement summary of both for that group you had seen a decline in the return on unlevered equity of that group down to about six and a half percent a few years ago. And the precision deal coming in was um, almost too much. There were some businesses that, that really would be candidates for leverage and for private equity and doing some things. But the Berkshire, the Berkshire uh, method is typically to try to let things work out. And if they become small enough to where they're rounding errors, you try to keep people on the books and on board. And you're not rash with shedding assets. Um, the good news is, I think with an acknowledgement that uh, at 90, now 91 years old, Mr. Buffett didn't have the energy to do everything he had done so the most logical thing they did a couple, three years ago was bring and elevate Greg and Ajit to effectively be kind of the co-operational heads of the business. And so Greg has spent an enormous amount of time now outside of Mid-American, but getting his, his arms around all of the operating subs. And you can see the post-pandemic last year, a real improvement in the two and three year progression of profitability. Part of it is I got my, my balance sheet to finally reconcile to a number where I, I've got a pretty good sense of where the equity in most of the subs within Berkshire are, but they've made some operational improvement. And it's not just the $10.5 billion write down of precision, but those businesses are operating at a better level. I think you'd seen, if you're an old guy and you sold your business to Mr. Buffett, it was a lot of fun to be able to report to him. And back when he was flying down to Augusta, He'd fly down to St. Louis and pick up Gene Toombs and they'd go play Augusta National. Gene sold my tech here in St. Louis to him. And, but at a point, you know, some of these guys really didn't have the energy to run the businesses. And I, and I worried that there was not a lot of good succession planning at the, uh, at the subs underneath. I think enough time has passed and Mr. Buffett's no longer in the day-to-day -day that that's as much of an issue. It, the, the culture of the place, you know, what happens post Mr. Buffett is important. In, you know, I have spent time with a proxy statement and you've got these Looney Tunes for proxy proposals this year. The news has been CalPERS is now gonna vote for separation of the chairmanship and the CEO role. Well, that, that makes sense in a lot, perhaps most businesses, but give me a break. It's a right. gadfly that's done this thing. In fact, I, I, I wrote this down, I think in case we got to it. The National Legal and Policy Center, right? I've gone off on a tangent. You can cut this out if you want. But so this guy's kind of an anti-corruption activist dude. Um, and they think we should separate the role. And Mr. Buffett should not be both chairman and CEO. So 
find from a governance standpoint, we talk about ESG, find a business that's been non-abusive to the shareholder, that, 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 that treats all of its constituents better than Berkshire Hathaway. Zero stock options, zero restricted shares, no history of write-offs and write-downs other than this recent 10 billion precision and other little you know, nit nit nats here and there. Um, the treatment of the employees. It's just, it, it's the model of how to govern and run a place. And the guy that's run it since 1965, his primary concern now that he's stepped aside from the day-to-day -day op operational role really is preserving the culture of Berkshire. I think that's, that's his role. And as long as he's lucid and functioning, the longer he sits in both chairs, find a better company on the governance front. I mean, that's just- well, I mean, so. just like, like the, the huge irony of this is obviously Cowper's talking about governance. It's like the most preposterous, you know, situation. It's like, like who are they to possibly, uh, long time listeners know that I, I humorously applied for the new Cowper's CIO job and they refused to interview me probably because of me um, continually poking them on Twitter. But I promised them that I would uh, fire everyone and invest in a basket of ETFs that will likely beat their portfolio uh, and save hundreds of millions of dollars in fees and uh, in um, political headache and drama. And they said, uh, sorry, Mr. Faber, you, you will not be interviewed for this role. So well, um, that's not it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. not it. What? You know, the, the, the reason you didn't get the job? What? You're not a card carrying member of the CCP. There you go. That's, that's, I can because apply they did manage Because they did manage to pull that rabbit out of the hat. Um, hey, so I, so I'm going to do one a rabbit, a rabbit hole we don't want to go down. Chris, we got to go mainly because I've been sitting for two hours and, and have to go to the bathroom. I've had too much tea and, uh, and uh, soda water, but I have to do our, our closing question. And you can't say Ross now because we've already checked that box. Most memorable investment in your career, good, bad, in between, X, uh, Ross, what, uh, what you got for me? Oh, well, in that section on Ross that I put in the letter, I kind of highlighted some of my doozies, my worst investment decisions. I mean, there's no doubt that the very first stock I bought, and I was a senior in college, and I had a little bit of scholarship money left over from no longer playing football. Um, put all my money in a, in a Norwegian, very large crude carrier company that I'd heard about, that I read about in the Heard on the Street column. Mm -hmm. And the stock was, the business was bankrupt within six months of my acquisition. Wow, that, that, that is some velocity. How did they manage that? Well, the, so in, in arrears, once I actually read the financial statements and I had to write over to Norway to get them, they, they had this, they, they had these four VLCCs, these crude carriers, and they were old equipment. It was a self-liquidating structure. You were going to get a bunch of cash flow as they ran the vessels. Well, you know, I like to blame Saddam Hussein because who wouldn't, but when Iraq was invaded, uh, or, or when Iraq rolled into Kuwait and they had two of their carriers in port there, uh, they were commandeered for a time by the Iraqis, by Saddam's army, but they eventually got them back. And the thing was absolutely going to go to zero anyway. And, you know, for that, it was my single worst investment because I had like $7,000, all the money I had saved from my <laughs> high school job, slinging tacos and delivering office furniture in college in the summer one year that little bit of scholarship money. That was all the money I had. I mean, I blew up all $7,000 and I had zero. And I was pretty despondent, as you can imagine. And either I needed to figure it out if I wanted to be an investor, because I'd fall in love with the stock market, but it's easy to get jaded when you lose all your money, right? And so it was either going to go figure out something else, maybe dance ballet, um, <laughs> or figure out how to invest. And I chose the latter, fortunately, but that was, well, that was definitely uh, impactful. You know, I mean, it's look, it's funny because you and I can sit sit here and joke, uh, you know, having been through it, being experienced and older and having the scars, but like looking back and saying, look, that was in, in so many ways a blessing, right? Like how great of a lesson do you have that early in the career? Didn't feel that way at the time, you know, having to eat ramen and losing all your money, like that sucks. But, uh, but, but in retrospect, like what an awesome thing to have, have happened when you were young and, and could afford it. I mean, could afford it in the sense that like it, it your life, uh, you had your whole life in front of you, as opposed to, 
leveraging it all and losing it all later later in life. Yeah, probably better to do those things vicariously, but <laughs> I, I I don't think you can do them vicariously. You have to yeah. you, have, you have to do some harm to yourself and hopefully at a young age to where you um, take the time and have the wisdom at least to learn a little bit from the mistakes that you make. I mean the the mistake you make is repeating the same mistakes. Isn't that Einstein's definition of insanity? Yeah, and going with it, my favorite investing quote: uh, "Every investing, every investment makes you richer or wiser, never both." Um, on that, Chris, I have had a absolute blast chatting with you today. Um, we'll definitely have to get you back uh, to see if uh, we get fifty percent returns or zero in in the coming years. Uh, you mentioned it before, but best place for people to find you, where do they go? Uh, you mentioned the website, semperaugustus.com with the archive of all the letters. And as soon as you're, as soon as this discussion is up, we'll post the audio and the video link. Um, so I've got all of our history, most, most of our letters historically on the web and then podcasts and various interviews. And don't and forget, we'll, could, we'll put it in the show notes. Twitter, Twitter. Yeah, there you go. Chris Blumstrand yeah. on Twitter. We'll, uh, we'll link to it as well. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mo. A lot of fun.